Good afternoon. I know we're just past 1.30. We're still waiting for one more to join us so that we have quorum and get this meeting started. So just bear with us. All right, good afternoon and welcome. I am Council Member Jason Dozier, Chair of the Community Development and Human Services Committee, and I call this meeting of Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, to order. I am joined to my right by Council Member Liliana Bakhtiari, uh, Council Member Keisha Sean Waits, who just stepped out for a quick second. And then to my left, I'm joined by Council Member Jason Winston and Council Member Byron Amos. Uh, with that, uh, the first item to, on the agenda is to adopt the agenda. Um, I'll move to adopt the agenda. Can I get a second? Second. Second by... Please open the vote. One moment, please. I think I was a little too quick on the draw because I know they're still getting logged in, so bear with us. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. Right, the agenda is adopted. Four yeas, zero nays. That takes us to the approval of minutes. Uh, I'll move to approve the minutes. Second by Bakhtiari, please open the vote. Vote is open. And the vote is closed. And that's for adopted four yeas, zero nays. That takes us to public comment. I believe there are two. I'm showing them. Okay. Uh, we have two public comments for today. The first one, Henry Jordan. And just a reminder, uh, you all will have three minutes. Of the fruit of her hands, and that her own works praise her in the gates. Proverbs 31 31. She is a woman of God who is enterprising and dedicated to her home. Jesus said James Griff is against his word that he created the income. If I don't seek to obey Jesus, the income will not be made through me. Christ said not to marry James Griff. When James received the income, Jesus created through me, when I didn't. He rejected me to be his wife. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, chapter 23rd verse. The penalty of sin is death, both spiritual and physical. When you ask to disobey Christ's word, you ask for death. When you ask to obey his word, you ask for life. If you ask for me to disobey Jesus' You ask for death. When you practice evil, you ask others to practice evil. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Psalm 70, chapter 1, verse. David asked simply for deliverance for himself and retribution for his enemies. Retribution is punishment, a medicine in return for a wrong committed. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, said the Lord. Romans 12, chapter 19, verse. Give place unto wrath. Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32, chapter 35th verse. To show that only God has a right to avenge, and he certainly will avenge. Fear the wrath of Jesus and seek to obey him. We living on God's time, 
not our own time, that Christ gave it to us to make a choice to serve him, Jesus Christ, or the devil. I had a vision about the enemy being in control over America and that the gift that Christ given me to help fight the enemy, they didn't want it. So it invited the enemy to come over us. But Christ has a better plan when we seek to obey him. It's not what we seem it to be. We don't have the power like Christ do. But we need his power for protection. And he let us know. He don't let us, you know, get this not know. He lets you know what his plan is to save you, to deliver you. That's what we like about Jesus. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Our next speaker is, or actually before we go to our next speaker, I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by council member Antonio Lewis. Uh, our next speaker is Brent Ingram. Mr. Ingram, you'll have three minutes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, first, I want to say I'm a resident of the city of Atlanta. I'm currently in District 2. Once the redistricting, I'll be in District uh, 3. Uh, I am one of thousands of active pickball players that reside in the city of Atlanta. Currently, Atlanta is the largest city in the United States with zero public dedicated pickleball courts. So we're number one. Um, I have met with the city parks and recs, um, Commissioner Cutler, and also uh, Mr. W. Um, we have discussed and they discussed painting lines on pickleball courts, painting the pickleball lines on, on tennis courts, I'm sorry. Um, great idea, it's a good start, doesn't make the tennis players happy, and quite frankly, it's like putting Band-Aid on a major wound. It's not the end solution. Um, keep hearing about Alta, Alta being the Atlanta Lawn and Tennis Association, seems to be rural recreation in the city of Atlanta. How many people in Alta are actually residents of the city? Most hail from Cobb County, Sandy Springs, DeKalb County, and other areas outside the city. So I do want to um, read a few portions of a article um, that Jabari Samana wrote. Diverse populations together around a common goal, recreation and fitness. It has the potential of attracting a large cross-section of residents because of the relatively low cost of equipment. Beyond cost, pickleball encourages people from diverse backgrounds to communicate and interact. This is especially needed in a fragment society where too many political leaders exploit differences rather than bring residents together around common interests. As low as the costs are to play pickleball, the sport could someday bring in major revenues to cities like Atlanta whose officials certainly understand the economic implications of a big league sports. Currently, there's professional pickleball. Uh, there's 24 teams. Tom Brady owns one, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Mark Cuban, and the list of millionaires and billionaires goes on. Currently, Atlanta actually has a professional pickleball team. Did you all know that? I imagine most people don't know that. Um, it's owned by Anheuser-Busch. Uh, Jabari continues to write, if pickleball in urban communities like Atlanta, Charlotte, and Memphis doesn't grow into a major sport, it might be politics and racial attitudes that get in the way. The old stereotype belief that certain sports like boxing, basketball, and football belong to certain racial groups and that ones like pickleball are white sports doesn't hold water once one realizes what the sport can do to build community across race, class, and gender. A couple of final comments. I understand cost is a big issue. Um, Parks and Rec has a limited budget. I'm hoping I'm speaking to the purse strings. Um, currently, I know you guys are considering a $45 million tax abatement for a 50-acre uh, project to build a data center. Thank That's you, Mr. Awesome. Ingram. The time has expired. Right. I might be the last. Or might, I will not be the last pick up that you'll see. Thank you. All right. That concludes public comment. Uh, colleagues, if you will indulge me, I know next on the agenda are our presentations. However, we have an individual uh, that is here uh, for an appointment opportunity. Uh, that item needs to be pulled off of Hells is item number 31. Uh, Jared, if you can read in the caption and we'll take that action and then move forward. Item number 31, 23C5050. 
5052, a communication from Mayor Andre Dickens reappointing Ms. Michelle Nelson to serve on the Fulton County City of Atlanta Land Bank Authority. This appointment is for a term of four years to begin retroactively on May 1st, 2021 and expire April 30th, 2025. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, Ms. Nelson, if you could uh, join us at the podium, just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in uh, continuing with this appointment. Yep, sure. So good afternoon, Chair members. My name is Michelle Nelson and I'm a native Atlantan, grew up in Southwest Atlanta, and I liked it so much, you all, that I bought a home on the same street as I grew up, and I'm not ashamed to say, most days I eat at my parents' house. I have been with Ernst & Young for about 22 years, where I've always been in the talent organization, and currently I am a diversity, equity, and inclusiveness leader in our America COE. And there I focus on all things culture. So on creating an awareness around inclusive leadership behaviors and the value of that, as well as looking at our mega processes to figure out if we can embed equity even more. And overall, just creating an inclusive environment for not just some people to thrive in our organization, but for all. And I actually see that very much as a compliment to the Metro Atlanta Land Bank Authority which you all know is a mission-driven organization that focuses on creating value for a number of stakeholders, our citizens, the communities, um, organizations that are nonprofit, small developers, all in the name of creating possibility through opportunity. And I come before you today um, for my reappointment. Thank, thank you. Uh, before we open it to questions and comments from colleagues, I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Matt Westmoreland. Uh, colleagues, any questions or comments for Ms. Nelson? Motion to approve by uh, Councilmember Winston, second by Councilmember Amos. Uh, please open the vote. The vote is open. And please let us know when we can come by your parents' house or by <laughs> I will. <laughs> and the vote is closed. All right. The, the motion is uh, adopted. Six yeas, zero nays. Congratulations, Ms. Nelson. Thank you for your continued service to the city of Atlanta. Thank you. All right. I know it says accepted and filed, but I think this needs to be corrected. In That's order. correct. Okay. All right. The next item, uh, we're going back to our regular agenda. That takes us to presentations. Uh, we have with us Commissioner Janae Prince uh, with the Department of City Planning with the quarterly update. Good to see you, Commissioner Prince. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. The floor is yours. So I know everyone's wondering what's happening in the Department of City Planning. But you probably lay awake at night and think about that. Gosh, I wonder what Janae and her team are doing. Well, what you typically think about with us is permits. I know you do. And I wanted to give you a sense of what's happening with our building permits. We've had Bit, a little bit of a reduction in the number of permits that are coming through. Don't know if this is a trend yet, but this last quarter we've had fewer permits. But construction valuation is up there. The buildings that are going in are worth more. What we're getting mostly is just standing standard building permits that you would think of, not the express permits, not the little simple things like fences. It's real, real work out there. This shows you the volume of work by the type of construction. You can see here that the permits have fallen off for each type of construction, not just one particular type. So commercial, residential, it's all still about the same. Just as you would suspect with fewer building permits, there are fewer inspections right now. 
And I want you to notice, I want you, whoa, still working? All right, well, I want you to notice that the type of inspections has changed over previous, previous years. Should I just use my outdoor voice? Okay. Majority of our inspections are now in-person inspections, whether they're done by our staff, NOVA staff, or a third party. There's very few video inspections going on now. And code enforcement. We're still at it. The greatest number of code enforcement complaints are coming out of districts three and four. No, not district five. <laughs> But as always, you know, our objective is compliance, not citations. We just want people to comply with the rules. I've been saying this a lot lately, but it has never been easier to get a building permit in the city of Atlanta. I can't take credit for most of this. My team did this, a lot of this, before I got here. We had a lot of problems with the permitting process. I heard about it before I got here. Heard about it over the years. And what we did was we took a hard look at, at what was wrong. And we tackled each thing. You would submit your permit application and you, you kind of wouldn't know what was happening with it, where it was in the process. You know, sometimes you didn't know if more information was needed from you. You didn't know, but now, now you do. So we've done a couple different things to address our permit backlog. We had about 2,900 permits waiting in process, stuck somewhere along the way. And we've cleared them. Now that doesn't mean in every case that the permit is issued, it just means they're not stuck. And those 2,900 permits represent 9 million, well, I'm sorry. I'll come back to that. <laughs> Okay, so what we did was we addressed the technology. Y'all, we had this whole permit review process and all these different softwares that didn't talk to each other. So we've gotten rid of them, and now we have one software that everyone uses. One of the departments that reviewed plans didn't, didn't review them electronically. They used paper plans, so we addressed that too. And I think the most effective thing we've done, the most transformative, is we brought on this development services team. They are the air traffic control of our permitting process. So when a permit application comes in, they know it. They keep an eye on it. They know when it's been held up for too long, where it's stopped, why it stopped, how to get it moving again. We started this in April 2022 with just three people. Tried it out. And in January of this year, we brought, we brought on eight more people. And this team, this development services team, they worked every Saturday to clear the, that backlog of permits. They reviewed plans. They figured out what was wrong, what was holding things up. And they called the customers to say things like, oh, hey, we need a little bit more information from you. Or we're waiting on this, or whatever the holdup was. And a lot of people were surprised and pleased to hear from us. Now, some of those applications we closed out because the customer decided they didn't want to pursue it anymore, or we got the information we needed, or whatever, but it moved along. All those permits represent $1.08 billion in construction valuation. That's a lot.
This is our permitting process. It shows stops along the way where the expertise is required and we have plenty. Of Permits are moving so fast now that I got an email from a residential developer so pleased that he got a house building permit in nine days. He was doing the email equivalent of jumping up and down. So we're really proud of the process improvements. We're really proud of our development services team. We're getting a lot done. It's never been easier to get a permit here. But what else are we doing? We're rewriting our zoning ordinance, and this is really important because our zoning ordinance is from the 80s. Now, back then, the city of Atlanta was competing with the suburbs and had a zoning ordinance that was written for more suburban style development. We've since realized that that was not the way to go. We are the central city and our zoning ordinance should reflect urban development. So there's been a lot of patches over the years and a lot of things that are kind of out of sync with what they should be. So we're rewriting it. The important thing about rewriting the zoning ordinance is zoning is our primary tool for implementing our plans. So what's in our CDP, what's in our small area plans, the CDP, I'm sorry, the zoning ordinance helps us to implement it. We've had four meetings for people to come out and give us their thoughts on zoning and a lot of people have participated. You know, zoning is very technical and it can be intimidating if you're not a nerdy policy wonk like me. But people are coming out. Take a look. We've had on the website for the zoning ordinance rewrite surveys to ask people about various zoning topics. A lot of people have come out to our meetings or participated online. We've had a lot of emailed comments. We've had a lot of people reach out to us, letting us know what they think and how they feel about the rewrite. So what's going to happen now that we take in all of this feedback is the zoning, consult zoning ordinance consultants are going back to their offices to start drafting the basic sections of the zoning ordinance. So definitions, kind of the basic parameters of the zoning ordinance so that in the late fall, they can come back to us with some draft sections for us to react to. So here's um, highlights from the last meeting. The most recent meeting that we held on Tuesday night was at, on Campbellton Road. We talked about conservation areas, and it was a very interesting and informative meeting. The map that you can see here is from the city design document, and it gives us a general feeling for growth and conservation areas, and we used that to guide the discussion on Tuesday. But stay tuned. It won't be long, and we will have a draft of the zoning code for you to look at. But while they're working on that, work on our comprehensive development plan is vital. So a comprehensive development plan, also called a comprehensive plan, everybody else calls theirs a comprehensive plan. We're fancy. We call ours the comprehensive development plan. It's a 20-year plan for the city's growth, development, and redevelopment. Every city and county in Georgia is required to have one. The zoning ordinance is a key tool for implementing what's in the CDP. So we've timed them so that we'll be working on them both at the same time. And when we finish the comprehensive development plan, the zoning ordinance will be ready to go to implement it. Or that's the plan anyway. Now, oh, I guess I gave away the plot here and told you what a CDP is. So our CDP, we call it Plan A, 
and there are certain parts of it that are required by the state. So on that list of planning elements, these are the topics that we're required to address in our CDP. The State Department of Community Affairs provides all the guidance on this, but they don't tell you what your CDP has to say, they just tell you what topics you have to address. So they're all here. On the right side of this slide, it says implementing elements, and these are sections in the CDP that you have to have. The community work program is like the to-do list. So the CDP is a plan for the city, a 20-year plan. That's a long time horizon, right? So it's kind of at 30,000 feet. It doesn't get into the weeds a lot. In the community work program, the to-do list at the end of the document, it might say to go ahead and take that deep dive into the weeds for a small area plan in a particular place that you feel might need more study. The capital improvements element, those are all of the capital improvements that will implement the plan. So there'll be a list there. And then the report of accomplishments. The State Department of Community Affairs and ARC, they review our plans. They like to see what we've done. It's important, particularly for grants that come through the Atlanta Regional Commission, to show them, to demonstrate that you're following your comprehensive plan. They like to see that, and it is one of the factors they consider when doing grants. Okay, what the heck is this? Well, this was our best attempt to show you that the CDP process and the zoning ordinance rewrite will happen at the same time and will conclude at about the same time. Our public meetings for the CDP will start later this year while all that writing is going on for the zoning ordinance. But the idea is to have everything done. 2025 is when our CDP is due to the ARC and State Department of Community Affairs. And we want to have our zoning ordinance ready to go then. The next thing we're going to talk about is the Northwest Freight Study. And I'm going to go ahead and let Nate from our team take over here. But if you have questions about the other two, I'll be right over here. Thanks, Commissioner. Thanks, Council Members, for allowing me to take some time to talk about our freight planning in Northwest Atlanta. In early 2022, we started a planning process to study how industry and freight can coexist with other uses in the neighborhoods around the industrial districts generally north of I-20, including Armour Yards, uh, Chattahoochee Avenue in the Upper West Side neighborhoods and the northern parts of Fulton Industrial Boulevard. This area includes half of the city's zoned industrial land and over 25 million square feet of industrial and flex space. These industries are in distribution. Uh, there's like uh, an economic engine in this area. There's four clusters of industrial businesses, uh, sectors that depend on safe and efficient routes and industrial space. Uh, these industries are in distribution and logistics food processing and manufacturing, construction products and services, film production too. And together they employ over 15,000 people, most earning a living wage and contributing over $2 billion to the regional economy. There's also three freight terminals, including Norfolk Southern's Inman Yard, which intermodal operations generate over 2,000 daily truck trips. This area is changing drastically though. More residents and different types of businesses are moving in, move cars and pedestrians are sharing the streets. And during the pandemic and into today, there's also record-breaking growth in not only multifamily housing and mixed use, but there's also new industrial space. E-commerce, co-warehousing, and advanced manufacturing R&D are leading the way. Trucks are heavier, trains are longer, and same-day delivery and just-in-time inventory are expected. These factors led the department to collaborate with the Atlanta Regional Commission, Invest Atlanta, and Councilmember Hillis to complete this plan and update our 2015 citywide freight plan. We will introduce legislation to adopt the plan later in May and uh, work with council and the impacted MPUs to get, their plan, to get the plan adopted before our August 31st 
grant deadline with ARC. Uh, to allow the 12 MPUs in the study area time to consider the plan in May and June, we'll request to host a public hearing at the July CDHS committee meeting rather than join the June 7th uh, quarterly public hearing for the CDP. We've been working with these MPUs throughout the planning process. Most recently, we've had a public uh, review and comment period in February and March, and we had a public meeting in March as well. Input from this time is reflected in our revised versions of the plans, which are accessible on our project website at freightatl.com. Recommendations from the plan include capital projects, policies for retaining and attracting the industrial development and jobs, and transportation strategies, and additional planning. Capital projects mainly center around designing and retrofitting our streets for both trucks and other users. This includes safer intersections, protection for pedestrians, and calming truck traffic. It also includes changes to traffic signals and maintaining and repairing and replacing bridges. We have recommendations to uh, inform future efforts by Invest Atlanta and other, uh, other people to retain and attract industrial businesses and train in Atlanta residents to compete for these jobs. We also propose additional studies such as improving circulation and truck access in armor yards. We recommend changes to the city of Atlanta's designated truck route network as well. And on the map, you can see some of these proposed changes. Uh, they include removing segments of Collier Road, Ellsworth Industrial, Huff, and Howe Mill. Uh, these corridors are experiencing substantial residential mixed youth growth. They're no longer suited for trucks cutting through the area and getting onto and off the highways. Now, truck drivers may still need to use these streets to make deliveries to and from the area, but trucks should use Chattahoochee Avenue, Northside, Marietta Boulevard, and other designated routes to enter and leave the industrial districts and cut through to other parts of the city. These recommendations reflect uh, the current work that our, my colleagues at ATL dot are doing, such as replacing the Marietta Bridge, Marietta Road Bridge near Inman Yards, as well as informing the regional transportation plan as part of the regional-wide freight planning work that ARC is currently doing. Uh, they also reflect our technical analysis and the input we heard from businesses and residents during our community involvement. Our planning process included both virtual and in-person events. We did walking tours along truck routes and in industrial districts to get firsthand accounts of what it's like to be a Riverside resident walking on Bolton while a cement truck whizzes by you, uh, how a carpenter getting off the bus at Chattahoochee makes his way to work on Logan Circle, or how an industrial business is keeping their truck base clear of cars and armor yards. We did pop-ups and virtual focus groups with residents and industrial businesses, and we met with residents in the Central Village neighborhood on Chattahoochee to hear their perspectives. These residents are historically left out of our planning, but they share similar concerns over slowing down trucks, adding sidewalks, and improving transit access. We led this meeting in Spanish and had great attendance. So thank you for your support in our freight plane in Northwest Atlanta, and I'll be back here in a few months as we go through the adoption process. I would assume my colleague Leah LaRue would be joining me now. Good afternoon, council members. Leah LaRue, Department of City Planning. All right, so uh, first up, we hosted back in February a full day strategic planning session for the Atlanta Planning Advisory Board. We are actually working with them. Uh, they, they divided the recommendations from the consultant into two sections, so we'll be working with them on some rules of decorum and on reestablishing or refining the purpose of the Atlanta Planning Advisory Board and their structure. We also produced the MPU University 2023 course catalog, which I've distributed personally to all of your offices. Uh, it includes, for the first time, a course on building permits for beginners. We just conducted that course, uh, I think, about two or three weeks ago. We had about 90 people to attend that class, which exceeds our average of 68 people per class, which also represents a 40% increase over last year's attendance. Uh, we also hosted an advisory group meeting for Participate ATL. That is our initiative to increase awareness and engagement across the, across the city of Atlanta. Um, I've had conversations with many of you and 
others about how we can work to ensure that the people that are not engaged in the MPU system can become a part and kind of get involved. So we have a, a really comprehensive package, a media uh, and outreach campaign that we're working on now and rolling out over the next 60 to 90 days. We are moving forward with eight recommendations to help increase uh, awareness of the MPU system. And then next month, we'll be convening a gathering of internal and external stakeholders to begin preparation for the 50th anniversary of the MPU system next year. I'm very excited about that, if you can't tell. And lastly, we are in the process now of awarding over $110,000 in neighborhood enhancement and capacity building funding for 18 MPUs. We have already processed about 90,000 of those funds and have about 20,000 to go. Thank you. All right, we'll add a bit of life to the presentation and what better way to do that than talk about local food, right? So I am Justin Nicholson, the Aglanta Grown Local Foods Promotion Program Coordinator in the Department of City Planning. And hello, my name is Elizabeth Beek. I serve as the Food System Planner in the Office of Housing and Community Development in the Department of City Planning. Uh, we are part of uh, the Urban Agriculture and Food System team. Uh, we work on an initiative called Atlanta. And Atlanta started in 2016. Atlanta actually had the first urban agriculture director in the entire country uh, here. We've kind of been pioneers in this movement today. Justin and I get to work with cities throughout the country uh, with their urban ag directors, their food system planners to collaborate in many things. And the Biden administration just announced and just opened their first federal urban agriculture office within the city of Atlanta. So our mission is to really cultivate a more resilient, inclusive, just, equitable, and accessible food system in Atlanta goals to ensure that 85% of Atlanta residents are within a half mile of fresh affordable food. We've been doing this through our five P's. So we do this through plans, integrating food systems and urban agriculture into plans such as what we've heard about today. And also permits, many of which we've heard about today. And also um, partnerships. We work with hundreds of people throughout the city to do this work. And then we also work on policies such as updating the policy, urban ag policy to allow on-site stands and people to sell food from their farms in the city. And um, also we work on programs. So I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Justin to share a little bit more about the Atlanta Grown Program update. Yes, so as I mentioned, I'm managing the Atlanta Grown Local Foods Promotion Program. Uh, the Atlanta Grown Local Foods Promotion Program is a product of a USDA Local Foods Promotion Program grant, which was awarded to the city of Atlanta in 2019. Um, uh, we are coming up on the end of this program uh, uh, grant in November, uh, but what our goals are uh, have been to uplift new market and distribution access for our local agricultural producers, of which we have upwards of 35 producers within the metro Atlanta area hundreds of community gardens, um, and we really need to make sure that the community members know how to access these community farms and gardens. Um, so what you're seeing here um, is one of our first public facing initiatives, which would be our local food uh, access map. And I encourage uh, you council members, as well as everyone uh, sitting around to uh, scan this QR code, uh, which will pop up uh, a GIS map app that will show you where all your local farms are in close proximity to you, and a lot of which are within your uh, council districts. Um, we are also uh, planning a series of events, um, farm tours, which we would love to have you all as part of uh, joining those farm tours so you can see you know, in person the farmers that are actively producing food in your neighborhoods, uh, as well as our annual uh, hyperlocal food festival, Aglanta Eats. Uh, last year, the festival, uh, we sold about 1,065 tickets. Uh, we had 25 local food businesses and 30 farms represented uh, to aggregate 
$3,500 worth of local produce from our local farmers. Um, this is an amazing initiative to really get the community involved in understanding what that hyper-local farm-to-table relationship looks like, and ultimately uh, building our brand, Aglanta Grown, so people know what hyper-local, fresh, affordable food looks like. And to back that up, I have uh, some evidence, uh, some local strawberries grown right here in Metro Atlanta uh, with our sample logo. Um, we Definitely, would you like some? No, it's, it's for you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, and um, I, I must add that our Atlanta Eats uh, uh, Food Festival proceeds go back to supporting our programs, our Atlanta Grows a Lot program, which Elizabeth will speak about. So if you haven't had a chance, we really hope that you can come out to some of our sites. We have um, piloted and now we're about to renew the licensure agreements for underutilized, once vacant, and what's you know full of trash city-owned properties. And we now have sites throughout the city where people have transformed them to start their own gardens, farms, and food forests. And we hope that you can come and have um, a taste of more food as it continues to roll out to our city and in our neighborhoods. So thank you so much. All right. Commissioner Princess at the last. OK. Uh, before I turn the floor over to colleagues for questions and comments, I had a couple myself, and I'll try to knock them out really quickly. Just a couple. Just a couple. Um, the first one, um, and maybe this was taken into consideration, uh, but for freight ATL, uh, I hadn't had a question about freight ATL until today because uh, uh, the General Assembly just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I'm curious if the new truck weight standards uh, uh, has impacted y'all's research and y'all's recommendations in any meaningful way. Yeah, that's been uh, discussed quite frequently with my ATL dot colleagues uh, recently because of those changes. Trucks are heavier now, um, and there are plenty of weight restricted bridges already out there, including that Marietta Road bridge I mentioned. Um, so ATL dot is looking at this. Uh, they are very concerned with these bridges. Uh, they're working on replacing the Marietta Road bridge. Uh, they're working on uh, potentially emergency funding for repairing a, a large pothole on Marietta Boulevard. Uh, so they are very much aware of it. Now, did I get into any of the recommendations? It, it didn't really change the, um, the analysis of what needs to be done in terms of turning radii and, and these restricted uh, weight bridges because we, we knew that they're already a problem already. Thank you. And then uh, with regards to MPUs, um, I'm curious if I know a lot of MPUs are going back in person or doing hybrids. Uh, any sort of top-level insights you could share as far as participation in those MPU meetings since those changes have been ongoing? Uh, yes, Councilmember Dozier. At, I would say, 2021 and 2022, we saw a pretty significant increase once they began meeting. I'm sorry, 2020 and 2021, when they began meeting virtually, there was a significant increase. And then it kind of plateaued around 2022, and it's been consistently hovering around 57 to 60 averaging across the city per meeting, per MPU per meeting. We have about four MPUs that currently meet hybrid. Most of them don't see more than 10 people in person and they're enjoying meeting virtually. I haven't heard any interest from, other than one other MPU, I haven't heard any interest in resuming in-person meetings. And we're supporting hybrid meetings. We're supporting their virtual meetings as well. Perfect. Thank you. I, yes. I attended uh, MPUS last month, and I was I, I was shocked to find I was one of three people there in person, including the chair and the vice chair, and then the DCP staffer Tony McNeil. So I was like, well, I guess I gotta stay home. But that's actually the case for all of the. NPUs that have virtual meetings. They're, they're not seeing a lot of people in person, but they do want to make it available in mm -hmm. case some of the seniors or, or just anyone that's not comfortable meeting virtually, some of them just got tired of logging on to Zoom and they wanted to come in person, so. Perfect, thank you. And then my next question is about the CDP process. 
Uh, I am curious if, because, you know, one of the things that uh, we see pretty regularly as a committee are all the amendments for the comprehensive development plan. Uh, we review them quarterly. Uh, how much of that is driving y'all's conversations about the next iteration of the CDP? I, I mean, I'm, we're amending, 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 but I imagine that's not the intent behind the, the plan once it's developed. You want to follow the plan as, as close to as possible. Can you, sure, can you, we sure do. Um, when someone proposes a rezoning of a property that's not consistent with the future land use map of the comprehensive development plan, they also have to propose a change to the plan. And that's so we can say we're staying consistent with our plan because remember, they look at this. So that's why we do it. Now, when, the more you get, the more you think, well, maybe we ought to take another look at this future land use map, and we'll be doing that. Okay. I imagine, too, uh, some of the, the plans that are informing the CDP are, I don't want to say out of date, but they probably need some updating and the communities change, the priorities of those communities change, and that is what's driving the need for these amendments. And so, obviously, the more proactive we can be, the better. So, I'm looking forward to those conversations when, when, when appropriate. Um, my last point is not so much a question, but just a, a broader comment. Uh, I appreciate the, the quarterly breakdowns of inspections and construction valuations and, and things like that. I think in a, in a previous meeting, uh, I was curious to see some of that same data uh, reflected in, by controlling for inflation. I know costs of construction in 2023 are a lot, is a lot different than what it might have been in 2018 and 2019. So the more that can be reflected, so just so we have an apples to apples comparison. I imagine uh, the pandemic had a huge impact on projects getting off the ground, but now we've kind of bounced back in a big way. But a dollar today isn't necessarily worth a dollar next year or last year. So I uh, wanted to add that comment. But also, uh, and I had a great meeting with our new uh, city chief equity officer earlier this week. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about is how can we ensure that we're using that equity lens in all of our conversations across the city. I know some departments, uh, Parks and Recreation just introduced their new uh, uh, equity, uh, their parks equity score tool. That's not the actual name of it, but I'm piecing words together that describe what it is. Um, I'm curious, with the, even with the data that you shared today with regards to inspections and uh, code complaints and uh, uh, cost of construction and even uh, CDP amendments that we know come through with, with some regularity, if y'all have looked at that data spatially and whether or not we can even see what that looks like across the city so that we know where code enforcement complaints are happening much more regularly, uh, where inspections are happening much more regularly, and we can maybe even help your office, uh, um, you know, I'm going to use the Army term, we call it, you know, just fire, make, making a, calling the audible, making a change to what was initially planned uh, so that you can get um, more, be more reactive to what's actually happening on the ground. Um, just thinking through where uh, there might be some gaps that don't necessarily get reflected in the bar chart. Uh, looking at that data especially, spatially, I think it will be helpful for us to, to be better advocates for the work that y'all are doing. Um, and so I imagine every inspection, every complaint has a point address attached to it, a parcel ID attached to it. Uh, it's been a while since I've taken a GIS class, but I imagine your team can pull that information pretty readily. Uh, but I think sharing that information back with us and so we can look at it across the city or even across our districts, I think, will be just helpful for our understanding of what's happening on the ground. So just, we'll do that for next time. Yeah, thank you. All right. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Our, uh, we have a few people lined up for questions. Uh, Councilmember Waits. Commissioner Prince, thank you for all that you do. Um, I'm preparing an email now, and I'm referencing the urban design meeting that happened on April 12th. Uh, at that particular meeting, about 30 individuals came to speak in support of the Leonard Tate street naming. For whatever reason, the meeting went on about four hours, and it was abruptly brought to a halt due to the lack of quorum. The question that I have for you is this, what is it that we need to do to revise the process? So one, the agenda is not nine pages, and two, for those individuals who took time away from their schedules, their jobs, and other obligations, to ensure that they are showing a lack of courtesy, professionalism, and respect, given that they waited four hours for a particular agenda item that didn't happen. And the last piece is that, as I was listening to the conversation, there were individuals who were there 
uh, with things such as a special use permit, those types of things. One of the families presented and indicated that his neighbor was allowed to build a mega deck next door, but yet for whatever reason, the person or the person with the application who was before the Urban Design Commission was not allowed to build the exact same deck. So in terms of standardization, and this is not the appropriate time, but these are the types of questions that I'd like to engage to ensure that um, constituents are not overly burdened or agitated with the process and that it is fair and equitable. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we talked about that meeting afterwards, actually kind of did a, a post-mortem of what all we could have done differently and better. And I would just tell you a couple of things that came up and we can talk more offline, but um, we are short a few members. So we really need to expedite the appointment of members to the Urban Design Commission. Also, um, we, we need some training, especially for our newer members, um, on certain legal concepts that, you know, that always need to be kept in mind during the decision-making process. And we can talk more about that later if you'd like. Sure. Right. Thank you, Councilman Waits. Councilman Winston. Thank you, Chair Dozier. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Prince. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, Northwest Freight Study, which was new to me today. Um, and if you're listening, Councilmember Hillis, I'm frankly jealous uh, of the study and its funding and, and just looking at it. Um, in Southeast Atlanta, South Atlanta, um, there are neighborhoods that are literally cut off by the railroad. Um, you've got Lakewood Heights, you've got South Atlanta, you've got parts of Mechanicsville, um, where we, I know Councilmember Dozier and Lewis and I have had conversations with Norfolk Southern about you know, train sitting on, on tracks for 24 plus hours trying to resolve that issue. Um, we've got state routes that are coming through our neighborhoods where we've got, you know, 18 wheelers that are moving goods, going at increasingly high speeds, causing dangerous situations. Um, I've had conversations with GDOT, I've had conversations with the freight, but it seems like a lot of these are just one off conversations. Um, is it possible that we can take some of these lessons learned from this study? and try to apply them to other areas of Atlanta, even though I don't really have a multitudinal station, um, we have a lot of the same issues that are, are brought up in this study. A absolutely we can. We're always learning new things as we complete each of these studies. And sometimes that information that we learn, we can apply it in other places, not just the one location where the, the study was performed. It's you know improving our best practices all the way around whenever possible. And, you know, as we are having these conversations, I mean, I'm assuming we should be including your department um, in some of these discussions as we look at ways to improve quality of life as it pertains to dealing with a lot of these mobility issues. Absolutely. We work very closely with ATL DOT. Um, the way we like to describe it is um, up until the 30% design, 30% engineered is when we hand off to ATL DOT. So all of the planning, all of the forward thinking as the Department of City Planning, we are supposed to be looking into the future and anticipating needs and addressing them. And, and do you know if there's opportunities to expand this study to other areas or, or look into new study or grant opportunities? We certainly could look into that, yes, sir. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Councilman Winston, Councilman Amos. Mr. Chair, um, first and foremost, thank you for the Ag, uh, Ag Atlanta information. Um, I do ask everyone to jump on that um, site and just play with the different maps. That's what I've been doing for the last five minutes. And it speaks volume to where on the west side of the city of Atlanta, we have one grocery store. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but we keep producing this data that keeps showing us the same thing about, and I stopped calling the food deserts because the desert is a natural occurring phenomenon and a grocery store not being in black and brown communities um, is not naturally occurring. So I'm gonna leave that right there. Um, NPU best practices. Um, I know we created them. Um, was a beautiful model. Where, where are we? Are, have, have the MPUs actually started using them? Where are we in the implementation? We haven't reached perfection yet, 
but <laughs> yes, the MPUs are, many of them are using the best practices. In fact, uh, in September, we presented that to y'all at the beginning of September and their bylaws were due by September 30th. Many of them had already expressed an interest in incorporating the best practices into their bylaws um, and many of them continue to do that today, to have those discussions today. Thank you. We've seen some improvements. Good, thank you. Um, last question is really to our commissioner. Um, I don't worry, Smith, with page 17 to talk about zoning and how it help implement our plan. The word our scares me um, because then it's whose plan. So when we starting with our zoning rewrite, where are we starting with the zoning laws or the existing um, council approved redevelopment plans for the area? So with the zoning rewrite, we are looking at what are the best practices to regulate the issues that have been brought to us as problem issues. For example, the development of parking garages and how they're designed. And so that's one of the things we spent a long time on. Anything that's been identified as a problem, they have really focused on that. But when I say that zoning is to implement our plans, it's because my opinion is that zoning has two uses. Nuisance prevention, such as separating incompatible uses, and plan implementation. If you want stores here and houses here, you zone it that way, right? But you spend a long time with the neighborhood asking them what do they want and where do they want it. That's the comprehensive development plan. And once you've figured out what you want and where you want it, then we can write you a plan to get it and we can revise our zoning ordinance to make sure that you get the type of development you want, where you want it. Because the plan is the plan, zoning is the law. And last question, and um, I was trying to figure it out myself, but you guys are definitely the expert. Is there, a, is there a time frame for redevelopment plans, like neighborhood redevelopment plans, to be reassessed to see if they're still good, valid? Is there a certain time frame since approval? So I'm a true believer in the planning process. What I would like for us to do going forward is when we finish this comprehensive development plan, that we get on a schedule of doing small area plans throughout the city and that every plan be revisited every, say, five or six years. So there would be a regular rotation of small area plans that would then feed up into the CDP the next time we have to revise it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I, <laughs> I yield. Hey, Councilmember Amos, Councilmember Lewis. And I think I'm standing with my two uh, councilmates to the right. Uh, Councilmember Amos, when he uh, talked about the grocery store being advised, see, I still remember when they built that grocery store. Um, in District 12, we have one grocery store, the entire district, the Kroger's. Kroger's on Metropolitan Cleveland Avenue. And I remember when they built that grocery store, I saw grocery stores leave the district since. And I was thinking about how we're spending our tax dollars, how uh, taxpayers in the city of Atlanta are spending their tax dollars in Atlanta, in my, in my portion of the district, because we have neighboring cities. And so our folks are going to Jonesboro, tomorrow, East Point, and Hapeville to buy groceries, right? And my wife is an example. We, we're getting our groceries from the Walmart that's in Hapeville instead of at the Kroger's on Cleveland Avenue because they don't have the stuff because of capacity. They're like, uh, it's empty because everybody's there buying stuff. And so when we talk about food deserts and the supply, I mean, not the word food desert, I gotta, I gotta use the word he used. I gotta listen to what he said. F food what? Apartheid. Food, food apartheid uh, communities. For Atlanta to be the collaborative project that we talk about it being a entire, entire city that is a community of affordable living, right? If you look at the entire city as a whole, we are a group project that got built to be where uh, folks who are less fortunate could live next door to people who had things. And that's how we built it. So we said, my kids and your kids. I would like for us to look at the income, not just look at the income, look at the people that are living in these communities. Because District 12 borders, if you look at the uh, 
the growth of Oakland City, look at the growth of Lakewood, I'm positive that the money is there and we have food stamps in the district. So I know that the funding is there and people will buy the food. So I hope that that's not the reason that they're using anymore saying we don't have enough people and saying that the money to buy the food isn't there. So I stand with Council Member Amos on that. I stand with Council Member Winston when we say this Northwest study. I wanted to know who actually uh, came up with the plan for it. Was it the city of Atlanta or was it the, uh, the private organizations that we're working with to do the Northwest study? Thanks, Councilmember. Uh, we actually, the Department of City Planning, when uh, former Commissioner Keene was here, came up with the idea. We approached Councilmember Hillis uh, for matching funds. It was a relatively, it was a one or two year old grant program at ARC at the time. This was right before COVID. Okay, so, so it's been going on for a while. Yeah, I wrote the grant before COVID, and then we had about 18 to 24 month procurement process because everything stopped. So we actually started just uh, 12, 14 months ago. Okay, I think that's why I, I had never heard of it any, either, and I know we've been working with Norfolk Southern, we've been working with planning department, working with everybody in silos, but I know if we would have seen this and known this work has been going on, we would have had some framework to start from. Uh, we've known that we could hold, we had more leverage uh, than what we thought we had with trains stopping, uh, cutting up Oakland City. Uh, myself and Council Member Dozer are getting phone calls every single day about the planes, trains that are stopping there. So I appreciate you for getting this out to us. My office will be looking at it with the hopes that we can copy it because it seems like we have three partnering uh, council members who share, and you may have some of those four council members who share some districts being broken up by trains. So hopefully that'd be enough pressure to, to get some help over there as well on the south side of the city. And I can share also with you um, after this meeting, uh, Atlanta Regional Commission is updating their own regional freight plan. And we just had a discussion about the impacts of trains being stuck outside of the city, but in the region at various places, and it's backing up traffic on Murphy and Lee and other parts of the communities. Um, so I'll make sure that you are also plugged into that regional effort. And I'm bringing those issues in Southeast industrial districts uh, to ARC during this time too. Thank you. And Councilmember Lewis, Councilmember Bakhtiari. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, just piggybacking off the, um, off the railroad piece, uh, you know, just saying, if we want to go ahead and start exploring the uh, purchase of Holsey Yards, I'm not against it. If you want to talk about more uh, proactive housing plans and um, better traffic planning, <coughs> Holsey Yards. So we can go ahead and piece that one together. Um, so the other piece, I was just curious, I know during, during the beginning of last year, Commissioner Red, before you came on, we were talking about a housing deficit map. Um, I'm curious, and for those who don't know, the idea of the housing deficit map is something that a few of us had worked on before we came into office, and I believe planning was working on for a little bit. Um, but the idea is that we, ARC and former Commissioner Keene, did a population projection um, over the next 20 years. And so the idea is to look at how much housing is in each of our neighborhoods and then plan over the next 20 years for that distribution of housing equitably and evenly across all neighborhoods so that not one neighborhood is holding more housing than others, and then trying to do a percentage of that of supportive, affordable, and market rate. And I'm wondering if there's been any efforts because um, the reason I love that concept so much is because if we would be able to go to neighborhoods with data and say, this is how many units you need to add, this is what kind of units you need to add, how do you want to see that come into your community over the next 20 years? And then the we idea actually that, do yeah. have that information. Um, the housing team showed it to me right when I came to work here. It was the group that has since moved to the mayor's office of policy. But we do have data for neighborhood statistical areas, which you know line up with the NPU boundaries. And so they did housing research in each area. So we know how many housing units there are in each area and how many more we need in each area. And I can certainly ask them about that information. I would love that. Yeah, just the being able to um... I find that even when we are confronted with like some people would some people would call it nimbyism, I would say that a lot of that in my district stems from the fear of a um, of a process that they don't feel is transparent when it comes to development. But this, I feel like, if we approach each community with the actual data and allow them to control how that is formed in their community with neighborhood input, it could take us a really long way. Um, I know I was working on that with uh, with. 
Director Humphreys for a while um, before he switched over to the mayor's office. So um, the, uh, and thank you for looking into that. And I was also curious, I know I talked about this with uh, Commissioner Cavaniss um, about the planning, also doing this in conjunction with actual traffic planning, because obviously density amongst arterial roads would be awesome. And being able to um, show our Atlanta community that there's more to traffic calming than just speed bumps and stop signs, as convenient as they are. There's other things that we can do. Um, and I'm curious as to if there, how the coordination has been with ATL DOT and uh, has there been coordination with traffic planning or traffic mapping or are they showing any initiative to do the same thing DCP is doing in terms of a citywide plan when it comes to? I'm not sure what their citywide plans are. We did have a coordinating meeting with them yesterday because there are so many projects yep. that we work together on. We need to work together on or we already are working together on. So I think you might have to ask Commissioner Kavanaugh overall plan. But we are coordinating on every project that you can think of. Great to hear. I'll talk to them about that because I would, I mean, similar to having greater density around transit um, centers, uh, it would make sense that that, I'll, so I'll, I'll follow up with the, with the commissioner on that. Um, curious, I'm sure someone had already asked, but the tree ordinance, two point, uh, the next phase of the tree ordinance, how are we doing with the, our bid out for our mediator. So just to give you a little background, we, we felt that we needed to have a very strong facilitator for those meetings, given the groups that would be in the room. And uh, we put together a request for qualifications and that we had purchasing put out for us. Um, we also reached out to every qualified person that we could find to let them know that the RFQ was, was coming out and saying, you know, please, we hope you're interested in this. So when we put it out, we got zero responses. Um, we called around to everybody that we had previously talked to. A lot of them, or several of them, were from the Kennesaw State Center for Conflict Resolution and asked, hey, you know, you, you sounded pretty interested in this, and..." You know, what, why didn't you submit a proposal? And um, there were concerns about the business licensing requirement because many of these people are academics who don't have a business license or the requirement um, for certain types of insurance. These are not people who this is a business for them. This is just something that they do as part of their career. So we are revisiting the scope of the RFQ, RFP, right now I'm not remembering which one it was, but we're revisiting the scope and we're gonna put this back out and we're reaching out to everyone. We have to make sure that it's okay that we get rid of these requirements for the business license and the insurance. I'm not sure how much insurance you need to stand in a conference room with a bunch of people. I mean, unless they're really hostile. Yeah, there's never hostility in a room when we talk about green space versus planning. But, you know, you know we're sailing. gonna get that out as quickly as we can and we really wanna get this process going. You know, I would be happy to nominate the chair of CDHS to mediate these <laughs> meetings moving forward. He already did his part with the resolution. I'll pay for your therapy. <laughs> um, and the, uh, so is there any, if there's anything we can do to help me speed up that process, if there's anything that council can help do to weigh in to assist with the relieving of those responsibilities so we can move into the It next. would be nice if y'all would show up at the meetings every so often. Okay, we'll talk to you about that. I'll also put it on the CDH chairs, HS chairs calendar. Um, and then just a couple more questions. Uh, the Speaking about the truck piece, has there been any coordination with AIM at all to discuss no truck through zones? I've noticed that with Google Maps, I mean, this might be a conversation for ATL DOT instead, but noticing that there is not, when you look at Waze or Google Maps, there's not an option for larger trucks. They take the same routes as you or I would take trying to get home. And so perhaps there'd be an opportunity to coordinate with both DCP and ATL DOT to try to coordinate with AIM, who has a great working relationship with both Google Maps and Waze, to try to create no truck through zones so that they are not, we don't just have a sign up, the maps actually reflect that because the tearing up of the infrastructure is gonna get pretty severe and I uh, do not want us to have, you know, DeKalb Avenue and other streets repaved or build housing infrastructure only to have it torn up months after the fact. That's a great, uh, great idea and I'll add it to the list of projects to discuss. 
Thank you. And um, hiring backlog, how are you all doing? Is there anything? I know that we approved funding to assist with that, but how is how are vacancy rates? We are advertising positions and hiring people every single day. Um, and also just want to give a shout out to your team and to you. Thank you so much for helping with some of the code enforcement issues that we've been experiencing. Um, deeply grateful for that. And a really big shout out to, Ag to Aglanta. Um, Y'all are amazing. Uh, it's amazing how great strawberries taste without Roundup coated on them. Uh, so food was awesome and would love to work with. I've already obviously talked to um, Jay Olu and others about doing more foodscapes and trying to do that at our different MARTA stations and also attempting to um, get y'all additional funding. Because I believe when you started, it was Mario that was your first and there was no funding for it. And then it was 300,000. I believe that's still what you have, if not maybe a little bit more. Not even that? Okay, so we should probably, well, 300,000 would be a dream. Oh, that is so sad. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but also, uh, I mean, that's good. So, um, uh, but I did not know your funding had gone completely away. Um, so good to know. And um, I would also, uh, I'm also going to be talking to him about composting. And we started that conversation with, uh, with some of the schools as well. So I'll be in touch about that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Commissioner Prince. Any other questions or comments from colleagues? All right, and that concludes the Department of City Planning quarterly update. That takes us on to uh, the Department of Grants and Community Development quarterly update. Commissioner Lina, so good to see you today. I think you'll have control of the slide deck as I believe we do. as it's tradition. Good afternoon, Council Member Dozier and Council Members of CDHS. I am Deborah London, Commissioner for the Department of Grants and Community Development. This afternoon, Deputy Commissioner Nicole Barnes and I will present our quarterly update, but in the room is also our Director of Compliance, Genevieve Jones. And we will start with uh, Deputy Commissioner Nicole Barnes. Hello, Council Members. Okay, so we're gonna get started with DGCD's new mission. Um, we're really excited to share this with you. During our last leadership retreat, we were able to kind of brainstorm with the team to see exactly what DGCD stands for and what our mission is. So, um, you can see on your slides, doing good in our community, grounded and in service, committed to moving Atlanta forward and dedicated to excellence. So key programs, um, as you're aware, uh, we are responsible for managing and ensuring compliance of all HUD entitlement programs, which include community development block grant, um, home investment partnership program, our home program, our emergency solutions grant, and our HOPWA program, the housing opportunities for person with AIDS. Um, in addition, we're responsible for our section eight program, the federal recovery funds, which is the NSP program, and now our competitive grants with that portfolio that we're working on. So key facts about DGCD um, and some recent information. So to date, in terms of our program year 2022 funds uh, for CDBG, we have served over 1,500 residents, paying out over $3.5 million. Um, for our HOPWA program, we've served over 1,200 individuals, paying out over $12 million to date. Um, ESG, which is our emergency solutions grant, and so there's regular ESG, which is our uh, entitlement funds that come on an annual basis, and our ESG CV funds, which was that one-time allocation for COVID funds, and we've paid out over $6 million um, in conjunction with that program. Um, some additional updates have been added to this slide to include deploying over 22 million in our FY or program year 22 funding, um, in addition to adding that competitive grants portfolio to our department. Submitting over 30 or submitting and participating in over 30 uh, submissions for uh, competitive grants. So, our DGCD metrics, uh, we have program outcomes and, and they're broken out into three areas, programmatic, fiscal, and compliance. Um, so we work hard to achieve desired outcomes established by programs 
um, within each program and aligned with the city's con plan. And so that's broken out as it relates to each entitlement grant. Um, we're committed to timeliness of expenditures. That's those reduction in those days to pay that we've been seeing and ensuring compliance, which is that increased um, monitoring. We went through a monitoring based approach in FY22. So DGCD metrics. So each um, of our entitlement program has different requirements. Um, so there are specific requirements for CDBG, for ESG, for HOPWA, and for HOME, as we indicated during our last quarterly update. Uh, as regulatory restrictive as HOPWA is, HOME is even more. Um, but we ensure that all of our metrics are in line with those federal rules and apps. Uh, regulations, especially as we roll out that most new recent NOFA, ensuring that we're looking at all these metrics as we're, we're making those award recommendations. And so here is our competitive grant updated slide as requested. Um, so we have worked on over 30 applications with partnering uh, interdepartmental agencies. And so um, Estimated amount to be awarded is over $7 million, um, and total funds awarded to date is over $3 million. Thank you. More numbers. We'll talk now on, about our entitlement programs to date. Uh, you all will recall that the city for a long time was very behind in its reimbursements, and so it is our goal to make sure we keep you updated on the improvements we've made and the fact that we are maintaining and sustaining the new practices that we have implemented. For this year, the calendar year to date, uh, as of April 17th, we paid 1032000 but really as of yesterday, we're now at 1052971 That's for ESG sub-grantees. For CDBG, as of the time you all received this, we were at 1,040,000, but as of yesterday, we are, we are at 1,057,522 reimbursements paid to our sub-grantees who have been awarded CDBG funds. Now for HOPWA, we were at 4.9 million, but as of yesterday, we have paid $5,021,430. And then this is a slide that I'm introducing for the first time with this particular update. You all, uh, of course, have stayed on us and stayed engaged on the amount that's being reimbursed to subgrantees. I know that they were calling and emailing you. But beyond that is how quickly is the city reimbursing itself? So this slide and the next slide is to keep you informed on just where we are as it relates to each of our annual allocations. So for example, in the top left, this is FY15 funding. So for program year, fiscal year 15, we received these amounts for CDBG, HOME, ESG, and HOPWA. And then the second part shows you how much is left to be drawn. Not expended, but drawn. And so you have that for 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And if I could just draw your attention quickly to FY20, you'll see here we have our regular allocation and then the COVID allocation. So in FY20, you've got the CDBG regular allocation and the CDBG CV, which was an additional allocation of funding that the city was allotted from HUD, the same for uh, ESG and HOPWA. And then in 21, you've got the regular allocations and then the additional funds the city was allotted for home ARP. Everything else is CV. Home is um, American Rescue Plan, but it's the same as CV funding. Uh, and then for 22, you see what our allocation was. And then for 23, we just received this. The newest 23 allocations are 6.9 million for CDBG, 2.5 million for home, 615,000 for ESG, and then 14 million 697,757 for HOPWA. I will remind you that the city was significantly impacted by HOPWA modernization, not for anything we didn't do or because we were lacking in any particular area outside of the areas where we were lacking, but because modernization was coming anyway. We've always received the most, and ultimately that was going to change, and ultimately is now. 
And so the city last year received $12.9 million, but for this most recent allocation is 16.9, uh, 14.6, I'm sorry. Updates really quickly. Uh, there's a lot going on with the department, and I know that everyone is struggling with hiring, but it's gotten better for us. Every key executive position within the department is now filled. And I'm really excited and grateful to announce that. And I'm grateful for HR's assistant. Uh, you heard just a few minutes ago from Deputy Commissioner Barnes. I mentioned that the Compliance Director, Genevieve Jones, is in the room. We have our Fiscal Director, uh, Ola Kausa. She's presented to you before. And we have finally found a competent and capable uh, candidate who accepted what we could pay. And she is our new programs operation director. And I look forward to introducing Daphne Viverette to you all by the next update. But we also have most of our management positions filled. So that's exciting. We still have some vacancies, no doubt. But we are operating at a much more functional state at this time. Uh, we, I can't skip the, the last line under resolving the backlog because you know it was taking more than 144 days to pay. We are consistently under 30 and i'm hoping that those people who were calling you before aren't simply not calling you at all but if in fact they are it's not about reimbursements uh, we are also uh, regularly conducting subrecipient monitoring hud monitors us and expects us to monitor our subrecipient and we've now gotten to a point where that is happening consistently we are providing training for our external partners as well as for staff so as we receive additional guidance we stay abreast and we are uh, competent in the guidance that we provide to our subrecipients. On this last slide, I will just draw your attention to just a few things. Uh, the most recent NOFA process is, was just released on Monday, and that is the Notice of Funding Availability. So those funds that I shared with you, we receive them, but we don't provide the services. So it's important that we inform our current partners as well as those who are interested in becoming partners of what HUD requires. So we did a lot of technical assistance and now we've released that information and the application is available. The application is separated by funding type and we are really anticipating a much more efficient process. We have a new program that we're using neighborly. Many of, of our uh, partners throughout the state had already been using neighborly or other systems similar to neighborly. And so this is in fact already a better process and we anticipate that it will stay that way. Um, I do want to touch upon again, just really quickly, modernization, HAPA modernization, and to just say publicly that although the funds have been reduced, we are working very intently with the mayor's office to make sure that our residents who rely on those funds don't feel forgotten and they know that we are making every available resource uh, even more available. And we're working to keep the resources that are really in jeopardy because most landlords prefer market rates instead of what we are able to, to utilize the funds to subsidize but we're working intently on acquiring and maintaining affordability that is our update for you today and we are welcome to receive your questions thank you commissioner Lyon. and uh, and just for both the city staff and the public's awareness um so every time one of us taps the they is over here, it cuts out the mic at the, at the uh, podium. So whenever the mic cuts out, it means someone dropped their computer or their phone too hard. So I just wanted to, to clarify that. Uh, before I open it to questions, Commissioner Lyon, I just want to just extend uh, a big kudos and congratulations to you and your team. I know when we first met, when I came on board as CDHS chair last year, the reimbursements for HOPWA and other programs was the number one issue that I got from uh, many of our providers across the city. And to your point, haven't gotten a ton of phone calls or emails or anything to the effect that um, it just seemed so dire when I first came in, in, in this role. And I feel like the vibe has just changed dramatically based on your leadership and the leadership of your team. So thank you all for, for putting the work to make sure that got taken care of and, and that we can look forward to, to doing bigger and better things for our city and for our residents. And so just thank you all. I, and I did want to ask, uh, and I recognize that this largely came out of a presentation 
at a different committee from a different body. Uh, but last year, there was a presentation from the administration to the Finance Executive Committee, uh, and what came up was the uh, uh, giving back $10 million of emergency rental assistance funding to the federal government. I understand the circumstances in which that happened. I recognize there's a difference between ERA 1 and ERA 2. I recognize that this was initially, uh, uh, there was a state money that was, they, they had trouble spending down, and they gave to the city to, to help them spend it down. So I, I, I get all that. I'm curious if your office has been involved in um, uh, or has put in place any sort of measures to help uh, address or remediate that put from happening again to where I know one of the comments that came up was, hey, let council know so we can make sure we're advocating and try to identify those individuals in our communities. Uh, rental assistance is probably one of the most common things that comes up from my constituents when you know, I'm about to get evicted from my apartment. Where can I find help? Um, and I know those funds, because we've spent down our ARPA funds over the last few years, those funds are few and far between. I don't know if there's any other federal funding opportunities outside of ARP that would help us fill that gap as well. But um, if you can just unpack that a little bit and share maybe what your office has done in, in collaboration with United Way or with the administration to, to make sure that we can be uh, much more robust in responding to those needs going forward. Well, rental assistance is certainly a, a top priority, specific to the funds that were returned. Um, I'm glad you understand the details, but the funds that we address as, as it relates to homelessness are primarily the ESG funds. And we are not in jeopardy of losing any ESG funds. As a matter of fact, the city was one of the jurisdictions nationally that properly and timely expended its ESG CV funds so much so that we received a third allocation. And so we're working diligently with our partners, Partners for Home, and all of the subrecipients who work in conjunction with Partners for Home to make sure that those funds address the needs as best as they can. Do we have enough? Absolutely not. We don't. We do not have enough. But we are working with the funded partners. We're working with constituent services. Uh, we were referring a lot of people to DCA's program, which I don't believe is, is uh, operating anymore. We have a list of churches and local organizations that we can send people to, but we have the same struggles that you do and other communities throughout the state that the need far exceeds the resources. But we're making the very most of every dollar that we have in conjunction with the home art funds. Thank you. And if you, if you could share those resources that y'all have with council members, I think that would be helpful for us as well. Uh, so that we can get the word out. I suspect is what you have to, the churches are like, mm -hmm. oh, you can't send them to us anymore, we don't have any more, but absolutely. And just in case we have some resource that you don't have, and I would ask that if you have any at all that have proven successful, please let us know because we get those calls daily. Absolutely. Okay. And then with the limited ESG funds for emergency rental assistance that are out there, uh, you had talked before about HOPWA modernization, are other grant fund opportunities also uh, going through the same modernization process that, have, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason why the hot wheel modernization thing, or, or component is so big is because uh, the federal government recognized rural, rural communities needed more funding and cities are essentially uh, getting less funding to accommodate that. Is that? That's uh, part of it, that's part of it. I will share with you that the city of Atlanta is one of the largest recipients of HOPWA funds. As a matter of fact, we are the largest city recipient of HOPWA funds, at least as of last year. I'm not sure about the current numbers. Uh, when I first started, I was looking and studying the numbers, and the city of Atlanta on average received $22 million in HOPWA funding, and then immediately under us was the state of New York. So the city received $22 million, and the state of New York received about the the same. Uh, Miami received a large amount, but all of us larger cities haven't been impacted, or most larger cities have been impacted by modernization. Uh, so in essence, that other areas can receive the same benefits that we've had opportunity to receive. The problem is we still need the resources. Right. It's not as if the HIV and AIDS epidemic has just disappeared and we're, we're receiving these funds that have nowhere for the funds to go. So we are combating the reduced resources versus the increased need and working really diligently with our partners to see how do we work on that? What happens? And I will tell you that our focus is owning affordable housing. If our partners are able to purchase the homes, they can guarantee affordability. And so we don't have to worry about market rates 
and the competition that, that lies there. Right, and, and I wanted to say that out loud for colleagues who may not understand what, because I know you referenced hospital modernization multiple times, so in case they didn't know what was going on there. And for us to ensure that we're advocating with our Congresswoman and with our senators to ensure that, you know, cities like Atlanta uh, continue to receive what we need to be able to support our, our populations. I, did, I was curious as whether uh, those modernization efforts were also impacting other funding streams? Not our other um, entitlements, at least not directly, but indirectly, yes. No one and no rule has ever precluded HOPWA recipients from also benefiting from CDBG and ESG and home, but you can imagine where funds are reduced something else has to uh, take up the slack. And so we can spend additional resources across the board. And I think we present better now because we're reimbursing more quickly, we are contracting more quickly. And so our advocates can also stand on that. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Councilman Ramos. Get on um, several things. I was going to ask, I see a lot of organizations um, that are being funded to, to, to do work and don't know what they're being funded for. So I don't know if there's some place that exists to where we can tie organizations with the work they're being funded to get to the council's office because we in constituent services work all the time just so we have some type of knowledge on who we can possibly refer people to um, as well. Um, also just want to say thank you as well because when the street committee can vouch for you and the work that you and your team have been doing to clean up a lot of the processes that um quite frankly a lot of our partners was mad at us three or four years ago um it is a good thing so you have been validated um, by the street committee and um and then the last thing is um council member dozier there's a paper that i submitted on um, monday that's actually asking for a process if there's a, a grant state or federal pot of money with 10% left within 90 days of its expiration for that um, um, office to give us a plan of action on how they plan to. So it's in front of finance. So um, hopefully I can get your support on it. So that's it, I yield. Thank you, Councilman Ramos. Councilman Lewis. So similar to what Councilman Ramos said, a lot of these organizations I've sent people to and uh, we're not getting anything done. Some have told us they're working on their backlog, uh, like uh, <clears throat> just, just like organizations. I know we just gave $50,000 to one organization. They said they had to clear out their backlog before they bring in new people. And so I want to, can you send us a, that, that list that tells us who, who and what they're supposed to be doing? Because I've been doing constituent services work since I got elected. I thought that was most of this stuff was part of my job so I seen all these names. Uh, the next thing I had was, is it part of the, uh, thinking about some of the uh, places in my district that are for, uh, eight, that we've given HAPA, HAPWA assistance, but I don't see any new ones coming. And I know we have, we talk a lot about the city being the number one landowner in the city. Uh, is there an opportunity for us to uh, look at increasing that, increasing the housing stock, us, and not looking uh, towards the outside? Because when, when I hear that, I want to ask you about that, the number that you just gave that said that the state of, city of Atlanta was at 22 million and the state of New York was right under us. And I happen to think that was because we were trying to be the beloved community for so long that we've always looked out for people. And so I know now we are becoming more of a, less of a small town and more of a big city. And uh, we are functioning more like a, a business. Is it because, is it, when's the, is part of the reason that we lost, that 10 million has been chopped off of the HOPWA is because we're no longer building these spaces anymore? No, sir. It, that was gonna happen regardless. That's been in the works for years. Uh, the funds were going to be, moved and shared differently. There's nothing we did to cause the loss. Unfortunately, our HIV and AIDS numbers also have not reduced. So our needs are just as great as today as they were years ago. So there's nothing we did. And we've got advocates out there trying to make that point on our behalf. But let me answer a couple of the other questions you have, at least as I understand. The organizations that you see listed are those who applied for funding 
and upon review were awarded funds. Most of them got less than what they asked for, as I'm sure you can imagine. Now, is there room for others to apply? Yes, but capacity is a major priority for us when we are reviewing. I shared before that many times our community advocates and agencies and even the individual um, person who just, or neighbor who sees the need will say, our neighborhood needs this particular service. I'm gonna apply for CDBG, for example. And while that's a great service, that applicant doesn't understand what HUD requires for you to actually be awarded CDBG and for you to receive your reimbursement. So it's not easy at all. They ask for a lot. I joke sometimes and say they ask for your thumbprint and your blood and, and your first child, but it feels that way to really small entities who don't have the capacity but have the heart. Now, as it relates to public land, I do know that the mayor's office and the administration is already working on uh, building affordable housing. We all know about the mayor's goal for 20,000 affordable units, but we are also working in conjunction with HOPWA needs specific to affordable housing, along with CDBG and Home ARP and ESG and all of those partners. So I think we're working well together collaboratively. There's just not enough money. Now, on, in the list that I will provide to you, it will be specific to the agencies that provide public services and housing, is that correct? Or do you want to know what every applicant is awarded? No, no the folks that we've given money to. Yes. Like I'm, I'm, I even got some on my mind that I'm looking at on this list that have told me that they're clearing out their backlog when I didn't say I was a city council person calling. And I would just ask you maybe offline to talk about what that backlog looks like because they submit applications for very specific purposes. The scope is specific, we award and the contract is for specific scopes uh, or for a specific scope. So the backlog may or may not have anything to do with the funds that we've awarded, but I can imagine that, again, the, the need is greater than the funds that they have. But we'll gladly provide that information. It's similar to what we share with constituent services. So I'll start by sharing that information. And if it doesn't meet what you and Council Member Amos uh, and Council Member Dozier have requested, please let me know and we'll update. Okay, and once again on the HOPWA, to be uh, clear, you said that the, uh, when we were getting more than the state of New York, it was not because we had the same amount of housing opportunities that the state of New York had. No, there, there were multiple factors considered, but you have to remember the very purpose of HOPWA was to stabilize housing for those homes with um, HIV or AIDS. So only one member in the household needs to qualify and the whole household benefits. And the need in Atlanta is great. The need in Atlanta, when you look at the numbers, this is just my rationale, the numbers for the city of Atlanta were very similarly aligned for the state of New York as far as housing needs and what HOPWA was awarded. I don't have specific details on how many people the state of New York serves with this funds. So I don't have that at all. I can only really speak to what we were awarded and what other jurisdictions that are similarly situated were awarded. And I'm thinking about the, uh, on, Forest, on Forest Hill Drive and in Joyland, I have two properties that are a partnership with Southside Medical Center that are uh, developed for uh, people living with, or with, with HIV or AIDS. And I'm thinking of that magnitude of a space, not single family home with one person living there. And we used to work with Southside. Uh, medical center and we work with several others even the agencies with whom or the project sponsors with whom we work have the same struggles with affordability if they don't own the properties themselves then so much of that is out of their control so I'm saying is the city looking at getting back involved the way we did it because what I see is a entire apartment complexes that are dedicated only for people who have HIV and AIDS is the city looking at get, getting back into that? And if we were to get back into it, would our HOPWA funds increase? Because I don't see them coming back up in my district anymore. Uh, and I'm riding around the city. I don't uh, really, rarely, I don't know of any other council members, how, uh, how often y'all see those particular spaces where they're dedicated only for folks with HIV and AIDS. And council member Lewis, I don't know that our project sponsors want to isolate those with HIV and AIDS. I don't know that they want 
apartment complexes that are just for people with HIV and AIDS, just like we don't want housing projects anymore. We want mixed income housing. I think families and those with HIV and AIDS just want affordable housing like everyone else. The city is in fact committed to that and our project sponsors are definitely committed to that. We're committed to getting as much of the money to them as we can. And, and I don't think, I, isolate isn't the word, isn't the, uh, the term I would use for the way I'm using it and the way I look at it is uh, I actually see, I actually know families end up living there. Let's say a parent, I got a person who I know lived there. I didn't know what the building was my entire life, uh, but now that I'm an adult, I know what the building is for. Uh, my friend lived there with his mom and his sister. So as a family lived in these apartments, but they weren't able to find any other apartments in the city because of like just having dip, uh, just difficult, to, difficult for her. So uh, that space was like an opportunity not an isolation for her. And I have two opportunities for folks uh, because they are, I have two opportunities in my district. I'm wondering, is there any other opportunity for low yes. income folks, uh, directly opportunity for them coming? Yes, yes. And, so, and what we are doing is focusing on uh, acquisition and rehab. So our project sponsors who receive HOPWA funding, we are, prioritizing, actually making priority number one, acquiring homes, buildings, apartment complexes that would be HOPWA eligible and would maintain sustainable affordability. So yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Lewis. Any other questions or comments from colleagues? All right, thank you so much, Commissioner Lannan. Thank you, everyone. And uh, that takes us to our next presentation, uh, which is a performance audit report of grants management. So I feel like we're not done with the Department of Grants and Community Development quite yet, but looking forward to our next conversation. Mr. Chair, I'll sound the- uh, Oh, thank you caption. so much, forgot that. So that actually takes us to communications and, and that will lead us to the presentation. Go it's, ahead, uh, Mr. Evans. It's item number 123C5057, a communication from Daniel Hampton, Chair, Audit Committee, submitting the performance audit report, grants management. Thank you, and we have uh, Lindsey Kuhn, uh, Senior Performance Auditor with um, the, um, the full name of your office, in this case, the Audit of the City Auditor's Office. Thank you so much, City yes, Auditor's no Office. Yes, no problem. Been a long meeting, y'all. All right, go, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I am Lindsay Kuhn, and I will be presenting the results of our performance audit of the Department of Grants and Community Development. The team for this project is listed on the slide. In February 2020, the city merged the former Office of Human Services within the Mayor's Office and Office of Grant Management within the Finance Department to form the Department of Grants and Community Development. We undertook this audit because previous performance and financial audits identified heightened risk of noncompliance with grant requirements. We would like to give special thanks to the staff of the Departments of Grant and Community Development for their cooperation, time, and assistance throughout the audit. Our objectives were to assess um, whether were to assess whether controls were in place to ensure that the Department of Grants and Community Development spent grant funds on allowable goods and services within the specified time frame. Also to ensure that the department was accurately reporting. Our second objective was to determine if the department complied with policies, procedures, and federal regulations for subrecipient monitoring. Our scope was calendar year 2021 through 2022 for the housing opportunities for persons with AIDS or HOPWA program, the Emergency Solutions Grant or ESG, and Section 8. The city created the Department of Grants and Community Development in February 2020 through Ordinance 201140. Although this ordinance assigned management of all federal grants to the new department, the department is currently only managing HUD awards. The City of Atlanta held 26 federal awards total in fiscal year 2021, five of which are from HUD. Approximately 20% of all Atlanta households are eligible for at least one of the city's HUD grants. HUD scrutinized the city's management and oversight of its grants prior to the organizational change, particularly HOPWA. In 2019, HUD investigated this award due to allegations of mismanagement and a lawsuit from a former grantee. 
The investigation found chronic mismanagement, a persistent lack of financial controls, failure to provide accurate guidelines to subrecipients, inaccurate reporting, poor oversight, and other issues. HUD considered pulling funding from the city. Additionally, the city's single audit of federal awards found similar problems with its HUD awards, particularly HOPWA. This slide highlights exhibit one from page three of the report, which shows that the department managed nearly $200 million across five different HUD awards active between 2021 and 2022. These awards total more than $30 million annually. In addition to the annual award funds, the city also received nearly $21 million from HUD in additional CARES and ARPA funding. The department primarily acts as a pass-through entity for HUD awards. HUD directly awards the city funding for four of five awards based on a federal formula, and the city awards grants to subrecipients who directly provide the services. Grants oversees these subrecipients and projects. The department manages Section 8 differently than the other awards, and Section 8 is the only program not awarded on a federal formula basis. For more information on that, you can see Exhibit 3 on page 6 of the report. We found that staff developed policies but lagged in reimbursing funds and managing the Section 8 program. The department implemented procedures to address most past control deficiencies with grants management. The department implemented new standard operating procedures in 2022 that addressed issues identified in previous audits, mitigating the risk of noncompliance with grant requirements and HUD recapturing funds. Employees have improved financial management of grants but could strengthen tracking. The new procedures have helped clear the backlog of subrecipients' invoices and reduce the turnaround time to reimburse subrecipients while increasing the number of active projects that are spending funds at the recommended burn rate. Enforcing monthly some reimbursement requests from some recipients could reduce the time lapse between invoice date and reimbursement submission, which averaged over eight months in 2021 and 2022. During our audit, 70% of active projects were spending at the recommended burn rate. Grant staff could also improve subrecipient and Section 8 oversight. We sampled files and found that grants did not document all the steps in its internal monitoring processes. Additionally, the department was missing over 40% of required documentation, including evidence to determine income eligibility for two clients with Section 8. The department did not have policies and procedures for Section 8, but had started drafting them during our audit. Grants due policies and procedures in 2022 covered the four of the five awards, excluding Section 8, and included controls over monitoring, auditing, reporting, program management, and fiscal management, which aligned with both HUD standards and industry best practices. Adding Section 8 policies and procedures should ensure that grants complies with HUD regulations for all five awards. Grants also exceeded HUD's yearly reporting standards by requiring subrecipients to submit monthly accomplishment reports. The department submits monthly reports to the Mayor's Office of Innovation as well. Requiring more frequent performance reporting should improve the accuracy of performance reporting to HUD. This slide shows Exhibit 4 from page 13 of the report. Please note that there is a slight adjustment to the title on this exhibit, which should say that Section 8 has the highest percentage of active projects within recommended burn rate. That has been updated in the report on the website. We found that 70% of active projects met the recommended burn or spend rate. The department reduced median days to pay by 39% from 2022 to 2021 and was at 28 days under the city's goal of 30 days for payment after receipt of a complete and accurate final invoice. Both HUD and the department's policies and procedures require monthly reimbursement processing. The department had also processed all outstanding invoices submitted prior to 2022 during 2022. However, this measurement of days to pay omits the time that staff spends reviewing and revising subrecipients' initial submissions. The department's review process averaged eight months for our sampled file. From the department's tracker, it appears that the longest gap is between the invoice date and when the subrecipient submits the request. The department's procedures call for subrecipients to submit reimbursement requests monthly, and staff told us that the department is already working to enforce this requirement. This slide shows Exhibit 5 from page 15 of the report. 
It shows that over 90% of sampled reimbursement requests included enough supporting documentation to substantiate the payments. We did, however, also find that grant staff recorded spending fewer funds than it drew down by a total of over $150,000 for two of the three awards reviewed during our scope. While HUD allows this practice of advancing funds, the department noted that it no longer advances funds except in certain circumstances. We also observed incomplete and potentially inaccurate data in the department's tracking systems, such as being unable to follow a project from their uh, contract tracker through the reimbursement tracker. The department currently must use multiple tools to report to HUD and the state, as well as the city's financial system. During our audit, the department told us it began working with a software company to improve its trackers, uh, namely Neighborly, as the commissioner stated previously. Strengthening GRAT's tracking system should assist in managing burn rates and monthly reimbursement processing. This slide shows Exhibit 7 from page 20 of the report. We found that for monitoring, grants did not document evidence of following some of its monitoring review steps from its internal policies and procedures, so we could not verify all aspects of the sampled monitoring reviews without this information. We could not determine whether two of the 46 sampled clients met program eligibility criteria. Additionally, grant staff told us that HUD does not require documentation of the steps but the department's current policies and procedures indicate that they are necessary. For the Section 8 program, of 15 Section 8 client files we reviewed to determine compliance with program requirements, we found that two, or 13%, did not establish client income eligibility as required by HUD. The department's client files in our sample were missing 45% of the documents required by the department's checklist for the Section 8 record. We had seven recommendations from this audit and management agreed with four and partially agreed with three. We recommend that the Commissioner of the Department of Grants and Community Development enforce monthly reimbursement requests from subrecipients consistent with the department's policies and procedures to improve burn rate tracking. Reconcile expenditures from Oracle with the funds the department has drawn down from HUD and IDIS before its next drawdown. Work with AIM and representatives from neighborly to streamline grants internals trackers and identify if these could be linked to Oracle and HUD's reporting systems. Continue to develop and enforce standard operating procedures for Section 8. Implement a tracking system for Section 8 compliance. Establish a mechanism for documenting all steps of the monitoring process. And update monitoring procedures and ensure that practices are consistent with procedures. To see the full report, please go to the website link listed. Thank you for your time and consideration during this presentation. Any questions? Thank you so much. I do wanna open the floor to my colleagues for questions and or comments, and then I wanna uh, give the Department of Grants and Community Development an opportunity to respond or to share any sort of insight or uh, follow up to the presentation. But before we do that, colleagues, any questions at this point? Councilman Ramos. Yeah, one question I may have missed it. What was the time frame of your audit? Yes, so our scope was for calendar year 2021 and calendar year 2022. Based on the risk assessment that we did, we looked at three of uh, the five HUD awards that the department is currently managing, and that was the Emergency Solutions Grant, uh, ho the Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS Grant, and the Section 8 program. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I just ha had a quick technical question. You brought up a number that I wasn't aware of, but could you restate it? It was the percentage of Atlanta households that qualify for one of the HUD grants? Yes, um, it was uh, 20%, approximately 20%. Oh, wow, okay. Affected, yes. Um, and I believe that was from the department's um, assessment. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Lyon or Deputy Commissioner Barnes, anything I want to add to? I, I do have one more question, I'm sorry. So in your time frame of the audit, it is still possible for some of the old bad practices to be lingering to be in your findings um, and corrected by now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I. I'm not even sure if it's 
fair to say, bad practices. So we did see improvement throughout. So this is actually a really positive audit. We were seeing improvement <laughs> <laughs> in the <laughs> In, in the department um, compared to what the reasons that we uh, selected the audit in the first place to what the department is doing now. I mean, we saw a tremendous improvement. Thank you, Councilman Amos. Commissioner Lonnen. We knew everything they found. We've been working on it since I got here. And while we acknowledge and we thank you for acknowledging that we have made great strides, the work is not done, uh, but we're committed to getting there. Any questions or comments from colleagues for the commissioner? Governor Bakhtiari. Please don't leave anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll just share, I know when you presented before, we were saying all these good things about your department, uh, but it's great to have some independent verification that y'all are doing a lot of hard work to make the systems work in the way they're supposed to or as they're designed and to ensure that the good the city is on a good footing with regards to this work. So I have a great thank team. You. I have a really great team who's committed to the work and committed to our residents. So we thank you for your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, before we, we move on, we do need to take legislative action on this particular item. Um, I'll actually go ahead and move to accept and file this Second. particular item. Second by Bakhtiari. Please open the vote. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. The item is uh, accepted and filed. Six yeas, zero nays. That takes us to item number two. Uh, Mr. Axie, I'm sorry. Item 11. It's item 11. Thank you. Uh, item 11, Mr. Evans, if you could sound the caption. Item 11 is 23C5058, a communication from Danielle Hampton, Ch Chair Audit Committee, submitting the performance audit report in REM process. Thank you. And, and colleagues, uh, this is listed as dual referred because this uh, presentation happened just yesterday at PSLA. So for those of y'all who serve on both committees, uh, you get to uh, have it a second time around. But uh, with that being said, um, Ms. Hagley, go ahead and uh, we'll uh, hear, you, hear, hear what you have to say. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Myra Hagley. And hello again, council member Lewis. I'm just here for you. <laughs> I'm just, sorry. It's, it's been a long day. Uh, so I am the performance audit supervisor who worked on the in-rem process audit. Um, how do I get to my screen? I can go ahead and speak. Um, last year, the Atlanta City Council introduced ordinance uh, number 22-0-1253, requesting the city auditor's office audit the city's in-rem processes in response to constituent concerns regarding in-rem related demolitions. And uh, just so you know, the term in-rem means against a thing, where the city is taking action to resolve hazardous code violations. We had two audit objectives. The first one, does the city's administrative in-rem process follow best practices? And two, did the city's demolition orders consistently follow state law, city code, and its own in-rem processes and policies and procedures? Our scope included code enforcement complaints opened from January 2008 through May 2022 and properties demolished by the city between January 2016 through May 2022. In our methodology, we reviewed federal and state laws, city code, and internal policies for guidance regarding the approvals for nuisance abatement activities and implementation of the administrative in-rem process. We also interviewed staff to understand in-rem related policies, procedures, and practices. We conducted research to understand if the city's in-rem uh, process and nuisance abatement practices are comparable to other jurisdictions. And we analyzed code enforcement sections, a usage, and reporting capabilities. 
And lastly, we conducted a random sample of files where properties were demolished to assess whether procedures were followed. The city's housing code provides that property owners have a duty to take care of their properties or risk those properties being declared a public nuisance. The, uh, the code states that the goal is a safe, healthy, attractive, and economically sound urban environment by defining minimum standards for property owners to maintain their properties in order to, to protect public health and safety while balancing against the undesirability of imposing particular requirements upon owner occupants. Owners are also required to register vacant res residential property annually with the city. This slide shows exhibit three on page four of the report. The Atlanta Police Department's code enforcement section is responsible for investigating property code violations such as damaged, leaking roofs, broken windows, inadequate heat, rodent infestation, electrical hazards, overgrown lots, junk vehicles, vacant littered lots, dilapidated or open and vacant structures, and other conditions that would make a property unsafe to its occupants or dangerous to the public. This slide shows how the inspector assesses uh, property violations and how these may be handled before referral to the in-rem process. Um, the city's goal is always owner compliance. So on the left hand side you'll see inspector activities and these include inspecting the property to verify if there is if there even is a code violation, and then if there is a non-hazardous uh, violation found, then they contact the property owner. And then they give time uh, by reinspecting the property after 30 days to give the property owner time to repair any code violations. If violations are found or highly hazardous violations are found, um, then the inspector will serve a citation to the owner to appear at municipal court. And so there are, uh, on the right hand side, you'll see there are possible outcomes. So one, after inspection, the code complaint is closed if the inspector doesn't find a violation. Or the inspector closes the violation, or the, closes the complaint if the owner brings the property into compliance. Or three, the property owner may appear at municipal court and agree to repair the code violations. Four, the property owner appears at municipal court and does not agree or is unable to repair the code violations. Number five, the property owner does not appear at municipal court and the municipal court judge resets the hearing. The, ins the inspector reattempts to serve the property owner. And if none of those actions uh, resolve the code violation, then the inspector can refer the complaint to the compliance resolution team for resolution by the city. So as you can see, the, code, the city's code enforcement process gives owners time to bring their properties into compliance. Um, there is no, the uh, city code does not have a set time for how many times uh, um, the inspector has to go out um, uh, so so the property owner has uh, I wish I had data to show what I found in in a cella it usually people had between three three to ten years um, to bring their property into compliance before demolition This slide shows examples of violations. Um, it's exhibit one on page two of the report. Here are some pro photos that show what violations may look like. These photos are from one property, and the top two photos show excessive overgrowth, and the bottom two photos show dilapidated and open conditions, which can pose a safety hazard. A property that is a candidate for in-rem must satisfy two conditions. It has to be both open and vacant and also present a hazard to the health, safety, or general welfare of the public. The property above is considered a candidate for in-rem. 
The city's interim process is outlined in its housing code and mirrors the state law requirements for nuisance abatement. Based on property conditions, the administrative interim review board or the municipal court judge issues an order for the city either to clean and close the property or to demolish the property. This process is spelled out in detail in the report. And then after demolition or clean and close, the city then files a lien with the Fulton County Recording Division or the DeKalb County Real Estate Division against the property for any costs related to cleaning and closing or demolishing a structure. This slide summarizes our findings and we'll go into detail in the later slides. We found that the city complies with NREM requirements. We also found that code enforcement organizations do not provide best practices for NREM. We also found that the city could use the judicial NREM process to recoup costs. We found that increased use of the vacant property registry would facilitate communication with property owners. But we also found that the city is not realizing the full potential of its software to track the in-rem process. Sorry about that. We found that the city complies with in-rem requirements, first by contacting owners of demolished properties, and also by obtaining required clearances and permits for demolitions. We found that the city contacted owners of demolished properties. Under the NREM process, the NREM review board hears all cases and issues in order for the city either to clean and close the property or to demolish the property. The city's NREM process requires the city to make reasonable attempts to contact the owners and other interested parties both before and after an in-rem review board hearing for a property. We sampled 46 files for properties demolished between January 2016 through May 2022 to assess whether the city followed code requirements for communications with property. We found copies of letters sent by certified mail to owners and interested parties copies of advertisements and email requests to the county legal organ, copies of the list pendants filings, and photographs of the complaints and their hearing letters posted on the walls next to the front doors on each of these properties. We found that the city obtained required uh, clearances and permits. Appendix B of the report provides more detail of the process and the parties involved. Potential clearances and permits include historical preservation, historical preservation clearance if applicable. For example, if a property is historic or located within a historic district, they will need Section 106 clearance as part of the National Historic Preservation Act. And two, environmental clearance if applicable. For example, if the property is in a community development impact area and it's not located in a floodplain, the city may receive environmental clearance to use CDBG funding for demolition. Also, uh, an asbestos survey is required. The Environmental Protection Agency has asbestos-related laws, and if asbestos is, is found, it must be abated before demolition. And finally, the city requires a demolition permit on file before any demoli demolition occurs. So we found that the judicial in-rem process could help the city recoup its costs. Uh, most of the city's demolitions were conducted under the administrative in-rem process, meaning that cases are heard before the administrative in-rem board. Um, but back in 2014, a report by the Center for, the, for Community Progress suggested that the city use the judicial in-rem process with the judicial in-rem tax sale instead of the administrative in-rem process. This re report was requested by the city council at that time. Um, and the report uh, suggested or recommended 
that um, the, the administrative NREM process did not provide the city with the funding or that uh, property owners took advantage of the city and the city uh, would continue to spend its funding without reimbursement. In the judicial in-rem process with the judicial in-rem tax sale of the property, the county tax commissioner can collect the amount of the lien along with the delinquent property taxes, allowing the city to recover its costs. The city has provisions and code for judicial in-rem process. We reached out to code enforcement industry organizations for best practices or requirements related to the in-rem process. We were informed by GACE, Georgia Association for Code Enforcement, that they have no legal jurisdiction and code, and each locality does it differently. We also found that the increased use of the vacant property, property registry would facilitate communication with property owners. The city's housing code requires owners to register vacant regist residential property annually. The Acela database show that from January 2016 to May 2022, vacant property owners registered only 3,486 properties in the property registry. We found that 92% of the properties demolished by the city using in-rem procedures were not registered in the vacant property registry. And staff told us that some certified mail notice, notices are returned unclaimed and some property owners may be unaware that their property has been referred to the in-rem process which is why we recommend the vacant property registry. We found that the city is not realizing its full potential of the Acela software. Data in Acela did not always match what was recorded in the compliance resolution team spreadsheets. The team uses spreadsheets and a file checklist to ensure that they have completed the required process steps. But the Acela database has data fields available to track communications, tasks, contractors, and costs associated with the interim process. To address these findings, we made four recommendations to the Code Enforcement Director. We recommend that the Code Enforcement Director work with the judicial agencies, such as Municipal Court and the Solicitor's Office, to develop a roadmap and establish procedures and criteria for deciding which properties should be handled under administrative or judicial in-rem processes. And two, to encourage residents to use the vacant property registry to develop a strategy to use various outreach methods such as and provide community uh, education about what the vacant property registry will do. Three, to remove disincentives to use the vacant property registry, prepare for city council consideration and ordinance to remove the vacant property registration and renewal fee. And lastly, to increase transparency for each step of the process, including when communications were sent out, to use a seller to record each step in the in-rem process. They agreed with these recommendations. And if you have any questions, but if you want to read the full report, it's on our website. Thank you so much. I, I do have a quick question. Uh, the vacant property registry and the challenges with keeping that informed is pretty interesting to me. I'm, I'm curious if in your evaluation of best practices, if there's other jurisdictions or localities that have figured out a way to impute data into that into their registry. So like, for instance, like here, uh, if there's been a lapse in activity for water uh, activation or something along those lines, that that could be used as a way to get a code that property is potentially vacant so that that could help, you know, get more data in the registry and, and get better um, analysis and better enforcement. Uh, any thoughts on that or have y'all seen other jurisdictions do anything similar to, to Fill, no, plug in the holes where there's opportunity. I, I didn't see that, but I used to work for watershed, so I actually thought that same thing. So I, I think it's a good idea. But um, the only, actually, the vacant property registry is the only best practice I did find. Okay. Uh, but, but they didn't 
suggest that as a use, but I think it's a good idea. Okay, and, and even like with the like working with the Department of Finance, uh, like for certificates of occupancy or lack thereof with their property, that just just thinking of other ways where you can film and then do the the do an audit to see what, whether or not uh, that's an accurate way of compiling that information. So just a thought, just thinking out loud here, but I uh, just wanted to add that. Yeah, so as Myra said, we didn't see other ways to impute the data, but that's a good idea to look into that. And for the public record, I just want folks to know that the Department of Auditing said that that was a good idea. So with okay, that being said. Okay, okay. Uh, well, let the record show. <laughs> that's Council a good Member idea. Bakhtiari. Thank you. Um, just the findings overview on page six, could you just again elaborate on uh, code enforcement organizations not providing best practices um, for NREM? Well, we looked for best practices because that's one of the, one of the things that um, the Public Safety Committee asked us to do, and we really didn't find authoritative best practices for NREM. So we focused on were they following the procedures um, and we did, we did look at um, the center, uh, the, the report done in 2014, and we looked at what some of the other jurisdictions in Georgia were doing, and we did see that other jurisdictions were following the judicial model. The, ju the judicial interim process? The judicial interim, yeah. Um, and our code allows us to do both judicial and administrative, so we're suggesting considering using both tools. Uh, so using administrative and judicial. Right. And, okay. But the primary advantage of the judicial is that it would allow the city to recoup costs. And then that would allow, you know, more resources to do more demolitions. How that. difficult would it be to also do judicial interim and what's keeping us from doing it now? Well, I mean, we will defer to the... Um, the actual department? The actual department, yeah, but it's uh, coordination with the uh, solicitor's office. Okay. So that, that's why we have the recommendation to work with them to do a roadmap. Dr. Jojo, is there anything you want to? I was going to say that's a good segue. We have uh, members of APD code enforcement here with us. That If there's anything you want to be able to respond to, to with the uh, audit or even with Councilmember Boxiari's question, you're more than welcome to come up to the to the podium. Don't look too excited, Jocelyn. <laughs> hey, so hey, let me just say good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, my name is Captain Jeff Baxter. Uh, I'm with the City's Code Enforcement Office with our esteemed director, Daphne Talley. Uh, so I just want to start out by saying uh, we welcome this audit, right? Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that uh, having an outside independent agency take a look at the way we do this is important. Uh, and I want you to know that we take it seriously, right? And Councilmember Lewis, I know you're passionate about it and I understand that and I feel that. And if I had a loved one that was going to have a house torn down, I would want to know was it done right and was it fair? and what's the process like. And so we take that very seriously. Um, to go back to the beginning, our whole core philosophy in code enforcement is compliance. We simply want the owners to comply with what they need to do so that we never get to an interim process. Um, but with that being said, we want to say, thank the city auditor's office uh, for their work. Uh, if you guys ever do any pro bono work, if you want to take a look at my wife's spending habits, I'll be more than happy to sit down with you and go over that, but thank you for your work on that. Uh, as it relates to the judicial process, so that would need to be a partnership with uh, the city solicitor's office, uh, and we would need to make that connection. And as mentioned, uh, we welcome looking at the roadmap in terms of what that would look like. But I'll let our rock star, Ms. Lyles, also speak on that. Uh, thanks for having us, city council people. <laughs> I've been doing this for 15 years now. And in the course of the 15 years, this process has been improved and polished. And I believe we've gotten to the point now where, with the audits, that supports the fact that we are operating in the best interests of the general public, trying to help to avoid 
issues of public safety and to improve the rates of uh, the in decreasing the rates of crime in the city of Atlanta. I think we've been very successful in that. From 2008 all the way up to the present, the process has been modified, and in so doing, we've become more effective and been able to increase our budget to be able to address these situations that face us every day. I think because of our work and the work, of course, with the city and the Atlanta Police Department, we have made the quality of life in the city of Atlanta 100% better. We're still working on it. It's a work in progress. We are operating under the notion of dealing with responsive and responsible property owners, their families, and the processes they go through because many folks have grown in the city of Atlanta. They've grown up, and I think maybe if we examine the motivations of people who stay, those motivations of people who simply overlook properties that have been in their families and the processes that protect those properties, we are able to address the public safety issue, public safety issues most successfully. No, this is helpful and just so I best understand because to expect you all to also do be able to perform best practices would also mean also assisting you in becoming fully staffed and actually receiving a livable wage, correct? Correct. That is correct. Just for the record, I just want to know, I know this is a bit off topic, what is their salary now for officers in the field? Um, that's a good question. I'll have to allow my director to answer that question. But go ahead. I believe. Uh, go ahead, Captain. 38 and change. I just wanted everyone to once again hear that that is what we are paying officers and expecting them to live off of. So thank you. Just wanted to reiterate that point, and I appreciate um, you answering that question. And Officer Lyle, as you know, I'm always here to have a conversation. I'll talk to you more about this offline, too. And thank you to the auditor's office. Thank you, Councilmember Baxiari. Councilmember Lewis. And uh, thank you. And I know yesterday we came up with a lot of new, new uh, resolutions new ways to actually fix some of this stuff to uh, my liking. Uh, but I think uh, the first question I was going to have is around the uh, data in Acela. Acela. And we currently have Acela. We're currently using Acela. And Acela database has, it tracks the uh, communication, it tracks certain fields. So in the city not, real, not realizing full potential software, is it saying that we aren't using it to the full max? Uh, you're asking a question? Yes. Um, so when it says, I'm reading, asking the question directly uh, from the city not realizing full potential of software. Uh, when it says a CELA or a CELA, the database has data fields available to track communications, tasks, contractors, and costs associated with the NREM process. Is it saying that we aren't using this? So we're, we're suggesting this code enforcement uses a cella to um, track complaints and they're tracking it. Um, what we found is that they were tracking it for the regular code enforcement, but they more or less stopped once it got to the um, resolution team and they started using um, a, their own spreadsheet. And we're suggesting that they continue to use the cello once it's still with the resolution team. You're saying get rid of the spreadsheet, uh, that, that extra, that you're saying the spreadsheet process is a bottleneck. We're saying that using, continuing to use the cello throughout the in-rem process would be a better use of the technology so you can track back and make sure that the, the data matches and you can see all the complaints associated with that property more easily. So we, we saw a few anomalies and it was hard to tell, well, which is right? Is the spreadsheet right or is the seller right? And my question is, why do we, uh, I guess this question would be to code enforcement, since you, you all saw it. Uh, why do we stop using a seller and switch over to the spreadsheet? We've used these things in coordination. Ne neither one is mutually exclusive. And so while a seller has not necessarily been developed for the purposes that we've needed, we have to track expenses, track activities, track clearances with the use of the spreadsheet. A seller does not allow us to do that. So it required both. And my question is that here it says that it has the, so are we saying that a seller does not have that access? 
Well, we, we thought it had the fields that they need, so hopefully it does. And that's the confusion right here. Yeah. Uh, and right here, right now, I, I just want to make sure all of us can get on the same page. And you yeah. can tell me if, if y'all are on the same yeah. page and if I'm on a different yeah. page, because it seems like well, y'all aren't right now, because it yeah. seems like you're saying that a seller has the capability to continue throughout the process, and they're saying that a seller doesn't. That's why they switch. Well, or, 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 okay. She said I'm saying something wrong. I'm okay with that. Can you tell me what you're saying so I won't put any okay. words in your mouth? Well, ideally, we can use Acela. I'm not saying stop using the spreadsheet until we can tell that they get all the information they need in Acela, but I'd like to see them try to use Acela to its full capability. Once, to be clear, you're saying that Acela has capability to do everything or no? Well, I thought it did, okay. but I, you know, we need to make sure. So I'm not, don't stop using the spreadsheet. We can use both until we make sure. But if, 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 so I want to make sure I ask the question before you answer it I, to I, make sure I'm clear. So if you are to give us suggestions for, for, for our in realm process, if a suggestion, if on the page that says city not realizing full potential software, you say a seller database has data fields available to track communications, tasks, contractors, and costs associated with the in realm process, I assume that the auditors have went through the entire process and that they know that this is a fact. I, and so I, then yes, if sir. that's a fact, when Ms. Lowes says that it does not, and that's why they switch over to the, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here for recommendations that we're making. I think there's a historic use of the spreadsheets. There is um, what I found because I did reach out to to understand how they use a CELA versus how code enforcement uses it. And so that AIM person associated with planning admitted that he hasn't built out the reports that they can use in planning for code enforcement. That being said, I went through the fields and I saw where they can put in dates because I found blanks and also filled in spaces. And I found that they can track the steps because I followed their policies and procedures, and they're, they're actually very consistent. So I will say that, um, but it's, which is why I couldn't provide you with any charts and graphs. I like your, I like your uh, suggestion of doing that, and I will hope that code, I will hope that the office takes that suggestion and that they just uh, assume that you're correct and that this can go all the way and that we fix the field so that the, uh, that the folks in the field can actually get it. Because that's the administration thing, not uh, Ms. Lyles. It sounds like two different other people. I mean, two different departments working together. And the folks in the field have switched over to the, uh, to the spreadsheet because that, is that you were told that or? I think you're getting some things confused, honestly. Uh, that's why I'm asking the questions. Uh, and, you, and it's easy to do yep. because the compliance resolution process is multi-layered we are complying with permits, we're complying with grants management, we're complying with certain clearances required in the grants that we utilize to fund our process. So while a cell is used quite a bit, it's used integral with the spreadsheets that we need to better be able to track the next step. Um, I uh, welcome you to come and take a look at the entire process. The audit that was completed is probably going to be re revealing all of the things that would help tie the loose ends of understanding in what the compliance resolution process, i.e. in REM, has involved. Because while we have situations within code enforcement, we are awaiting results from without code enforcement, meaning outside of the Office of Code Enforcement. So we track activities that we have no control over, and then we track activities that we do, in fact, schedule and have control over. And, and uh, just to make to be clear, the uh, way that I looked at the entire process myself was to make this request. And I was assuming that they looked at the entire process. Did you all not? They looked at the entire process, Mr. Lewis. So that's us looking at the entire process with some auditors that are unbiased right there. And then they gave us suggestions. 
And one of their suggestions that the one I'm talking about right now on the city not realizing their potential of the software, and I'm a, I'm, I like the computer software stuff. And so they also say, are there any cons inconsistencies between, and this is to the auditors, uh, the unbiased folks, is there any inconsistencies between the spreadsheet, because I thought I heard that as well, between the spreadsheet and yes. Aquila? Yeah, we did see some inconsistencies between the spreadsheet so, and Acela. So according to what Ms. Lyles, I want to make sure, to make sure I'm not, to make sure that I am saying this correct, Ms. Lyles, uh, did you just say there aren't any, you said they were the same? Are you saying that there aren't any inconsistencies? She said there are inconsistencies in the process when you switch from the spreadsheet to a seller. She just said it. I think what I'm trying to get across to you is one supports the other. Okay. Well, we have it. We are operating on the notion of utilizing a seller as the foundation. That's where we start. The spreadsheets that are used. And Ms. Lyle, if you can speak into the mic, my apologies. The spreadsheets that we use simply are an extra tool. We do not eliminate either one, but because of the multiple layers of information that allows us to function properly, best practices again, we use both. One is a foundation, one is to help facilitate the end, uh, the end result. And historically, that's what we've done. But from what the audit, part of the reason why we asked for the audit is so that we can streamline and make it as efficient and effective as possible. And the suggestions of the audit is that the, when we switch from, and you tell me if I'm wrong right here, because I want to I want to make sure I'm saying what the auditors are saying. The suggestion on this page, on page 12, is that we are not using the full the full capabilities of the software, and there are inconsistencies in the spreadsheet and the software. That's what they've said, and you tell me if I'm wrong. And so that means that we are currently not using the best practice. Well, we saw According the, to them, the I want to listen to the unbiased folks. We saw the fields weren't fully filled out in Acela once, that the, once the complaint was shifted over to the compliance resolution team. So, and I, I'm sure that the team will, you know, review their policies and procedures and decide what needs to be filled out in a cell and whether anything still needs to be recorded in a spreadsheet. It's possible they'll still need to keep some kind of spreadsheet recording. But hopefully, you know, the dates, you know, the four key dates that need to be, the communications need to be sent can be recorded in a cell. I, I just, because I know sometimes we get used to doing stuff the same way all the time. And... I think that this suggestion, this audit that we spent money on, I want to take the suggestions and not just say, hey, we've been doing it this way this time. Because it sounds like the moment that we switch over to this software, this spreadsheet, there may be some inconsistencies. And before that, there weren't any. And can you tell me am I wrong there? And that's to the auditors. Well, I'll, I'll just, Council Member, if I could just add, just so I'm clear the APD code enforcement team accepted the recommendations that came out of the audit. They, right? they don't, if they, if she's saying, if they're contradicting on those two, on that well, one fact, they don't agree. They've accept, by accepting the recommendations, then they are looking to implement the okay. what's being yeah. So it's so going to happen. It, I'm just, we're talking about correct. something that ain't going to happen, that don't matter no more. Correct. We, we accept gotcha. the recommendations, and as Ms. Child said, when it comes to the layering of the process, we'll look at how to use those data fields in the CELA to add to the layering to put those together. Okay, and I know yesterday we talked about, thank you uh, for clearing that up. That means we're going to, uh, thank you. And so I think my next, yesterday we talked about putting in some paperwork, uh, putting in legislation to make it to where the NWIM process, the, uh, the selling of the, um, the selling, who was here yesterday? Uh, the selling of the deeds or the, the selling the of liens, the liens. The, liens. Yep. the selling of the liens uh, for City of Atlanta would stop. We were we would be working on legislation. The folks over here would be working on legislation to make it to where the selling of liens from the city of Atlanta was stopped from uh, the Fulton County. I don't know if we're going to be working on a, a sister legislation in this committee as well, but I would like for us to try to draft something to make it to where 
the Fulton County or any solicitor cannot sell liens of the city of Atlanta once the interim process has happened. And also, I would like, I learned this from Mr. Buns yesterday that I can say this and you would, uh, the smart people would find a way to write this up for us because we don't have the uh, unbiased auditors tell us some of the stuff to do. I like when we have unbiased folks coming here. And so my next thing I would like for you to uh, look into is to see if there's a way to where we can, and I don't know if, I want to ask if this audit looked at that. Did we look at the difference between tearing the interim process or tearing down, uh, demolishing single family houses to businesses? Because I live in an area where I have a lot of businesses with open hope. Ms. Lyles actually, they actually visited one with me, uh, the department uh, not too long ago or overall Cleveland Avenue Metropolitan. We have businesses that have been there for 10 years with holes in the roof, uh, no tarp over it. Uh, nothing has happened, but I've seen single family properties getting torn down within that. That I don't want to give a date on it, but I, did we look at that? I think um, with the, and, and please step in, Joc Ms. Jocelyn. Um, what I understand is that they prioritize um, if it's going to impact um, families and children. So, which is why, you, I, I, as far as I know, what I could see of their process, it's the same for both commercial and residential. Um, but, it, but again, they can't handle everything because their staff is so small. And there's, there's limited funding. So they really can't address all complaints. Since day one, I've gotten here and I've said, not the amount of code enforcement officers we have don't match the city. We have 26 uh, MPUs in the city of Atlanta. We have 12 code enforcement officers. So I think uh, less than that, we had about eight. I think the average for amount, average MPUs per code enforcement officer is 3.25. So I did the data numbers. I just want to make sure that the un unbiased folks are doing our part so that the folks never they go into the field because I, I believe they're doing their job the best they can do their job, but I want to give them the support. I, I will just say I went out with with one of them and that house I showed with those photos, I went to that house. I walked into the front door and I said, I, I, I don't think I can go any further. Um, it is, I think they do a tremendous job and there were, at the time of my audit, there were only two of these particular inspectors that actually went in and took these photos. It's the worst thing we can ever talk about when we talk about the city and the uh, investment in that department, uh, the growth of it. But I want to make sure that we aren't. Because of that, I want to just make sure we're doing all this stuff right. I appreciate your suggestions. I appreciate the department for accepting them. I can't wait to see us uh, move in action on them and get rid of some of these spreadsheets as well. Thank you. I, I didn't. I, to me, I hope I didn't uh, say anything that she, to me, I, she's the rock star. We always talk about it. But to me also, as a legislator, it's my job to protect folks in the city. I know a bureaucrat's your job is to do your job, but I'm an elected official. Uh, my job is to also protect the least of thee, right? And so I'm seeing a lot of businesses in my district that have been there for a long time. Uh, they selling drugs out of, one of them is an open air trap house on the corner of Cleveland Avenue and Metropolitan, across the street from our one grocery store, behind a CVS and across the street from an old folk home. And I know how that goes. So they've been able to survive forever, but we're seeing houses getting torn down. So I wanna make sure, but I appreciate you. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. Councilmember Westmoreland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no questions for me. Thank you for the audit. Thank you for your work. Motion to accept and file. Motion is set and followed by Councilman Westmoreland. Second by Lewis. Please open the vote. Wait, says an aye. The vote is open. The right, vote the is closed. The motion to accept and file carries six yeas, zero nays. Thank you all so much for joining us today. All right, that concludes communications, and we pulled the one item off of door first, so that concludes that portion. That takes us to, or, we don't have any ordinances for first reading. Uh, that takes us to ordinances for second reading. Mr. Evans, please sound the first caption, item number two.
Item number two, 2301186, an ordinance by Community Development and Human Services Committee to amend ordinance 2301136 to clarify the appointing authority for the two members added to the composition of the Human Relations Commission thereby and for other purposes. All right. Um, I can't remember if we had anybody to speak to this particular item. Okay, colleagues. Should Motion to approve. <laughs> Thank you. All second. Motion by Westmoreland, second by Dozier. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. The item is favorable, 68 0 nays. And just for the public record, colleagues uh, and colleagues, uh, that was just to add a couple more members to the human. Uh, Relations Commission uh, and just clarifying uh, the language of who uh, was appointed by whom. So with that, that takes us to item number three. Uh, Mr. Evans, please sign the, the caption. 2301213, an ordinance by Council Member Mary Norwood to rename Haynes Manor Park to Sam T. Roberts Memorial Park to waive certain provisions of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances relating to the dedication of public places within the City of Atlanta, which are not ap applicable where a dedication is initiated by the city of Atlanta and for other purposes. Colleagues, the uh, author has asked us to hold this particular paper, so I'll move to hold. Second by Westmoreland, please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. The motion to hold is favorable, six yeas, zero nays. That concludes ordinances for a second reading. That takes us to resolutions, item number four. Mr. Evans. 23R3400, a resolution by council members Michael Julian Bond, Marcy Collier Overstreet, and Matt Westmoreland, pursuant to section 6 306 of the City of Atlanta's charter authorizing the City of Atlanta to donate $80,000 and zero cents to Second Helpings Atlanta to support initiatives to provide free meals to City of Atlanta residents facing food insecurities, authorizing the mayor or his designee to enter into a donation agreement with Second Helpings Atlanta, authorizing the chief financial officer to make all payments from the count numbers listed herein and for other purposes. <laughs> Motion to approve by Westmoreland, second by uh, Lewis. Any discussion? Seeing none, please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I am as favorable, six days, your nays, and I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Theo Pace for his time today. Uh, <laughs> the next item, number five, uh, please sign a caption. Item five, 23R3401, a resolution by council member Byron D. Amos, authorizing the mayor or his designee to enter into a contract number listed here, uh, MLK Drive and ABI Bridge Abutment Art Installation with Maria Artemis DBA Artemis Studios LLC pursuant to Section 2-1191.1 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances for a signature metal and light sculpture public artwork under the Atlanta Beltline Bridge at Martin Luther King Jr. Drive in an amount not to exceed $270,000.00 to be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Before I defer to either the author or Mr. Witherspoon with the Office of Cultural Affairs, I believe uh, there was an amendment that needs to, we didn't, have not received that yet? Okay, so what we'll do, um, Mr. Witherspoon, I'll give you an opportunity to talk about the legislation, uh, but I will uh, make a motion, uh, or uh, defer to my colleague, but uh, uh, recommend making a motion to approve on condition for us to receive that amendment to clear up some of the couch screens. But before we get to that point, uh, Mr. Witherspoon. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Witherspoon, representing the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. And this resolution will allow the City of Atlanta to enter an agreement with Maria Artemis of Artemis uh, Studios, that's an Atlanta artist, to build and install a one-of-a-kind metal and light sculpture under the bridge of the ABI crossing on MLK Drive. Uh, this landmark art project will be located near uh, Washington Park neighborhood and will honor Atlanta's unique civil rights history. Uh, the artworks design was selected using a competitive process in accordance with the city's public art master plan. And uh, we're working diligently with uh, DOP to make the uh, substitute amendment quickly and get it turned around and ready. Thank you. I believe there was a 
motion to approve on condition of a substitute by next Monday's uh, full council meeting by council member Amos. I will second that motion. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. The item is favorable. Um, seven yeas, zero nays. Uh, the next item is number six, resolution 23-R-3413. Mr. Evans. A resolution by Council Member Andrea L. Boone authorizing the City of Atlanta to donate as a subrecipient American Rescue Plan Act funds to Health Resources in Action pursuant to Section 6-306 of the City of Atlanta's Charter in an amount not to exceed $1,375,392.00 for the purpose of administering grants to youth serving nonprofit organizations for the provision of outreach and life coaching services to the city youth disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic that are at high risk of, of violent injury and death and for other purposes. Colleagues, there is an amendment for this particular item. It's the fix account strings related to the resolution. I'll go ahead and uh, move to amend. Second by Westmoreland, please open the vote. The vote is open and the vote is closed. All right, the item is amended, seven yeas, you and A's, and then we have Lashandra Burks with the, I always forget your title, I get it wrong every single time. It's okay. Good afternoon, Lashandra Burks, Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. The legislation before you today, uh, as stated, is with HRIA. Um, HRIA has a long track record of partnerships and contracts with federal governments, with federal partners, including CDC, Department of Health and Human Services, and some local government agencies. And this is a grant making um, for community focused initiatives um, across the nation. So very specific to Atlanta, HRIA would provide grants to youth serving organizations who specifically are working with youth who are victims of crime and especially during the COVID-19 period for Atlanta. And so we've done some youth grants before with American Rescue Plan dollars, but this one was focused specifically on youth um, who have been um, victims of violent crime and helping them with life coaching and getting back acclimated to society. Thank you. Any questions or comments from colleagues? There's a motion to approve as amended by Winston, second by Bakhtiari. Please open the vote. The vote is open. The item is favorable as amended, seven yeas, zero nays. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. Item number 7, 23R3424, a resolution by Council Member Matt Westmoreland authorizing the mayor or his designee to enter into agreements with two vendors under agreement number listed here, Senders of Hope after school programming services with future seekers in an amount not to exceed $168,000.00 annually and Youth Science Academy in an amount not to exceed $180,000.00 annually to provide youth teen out of school programming on behalf of the Department of Parks and Recreation. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Deputy Commissioner Voss. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of Council, Doug Voss, Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, DPR aims to serve over 1,500 children in our after school programs at over 15 sites um, each year. And as part of that program, we try to offer engaging and structured activities. Um, working with Department of uh, Procurement we put out a bid uh, for Centers of Hope After School Programming, and we received a number of bids, 12 of which um, we have accepted, two of which require legislative approval because they're over $100,000. That's to Future Seekers and Youth Science Academy. The term of each of the agreements is for two years with two one-year renewals, and in all, as a group, um, three of these groups will provide academic support, which is basically homework assistance, three academic enrichment, four for health and fitness, three technology, three character and leadership, and four performing and visual arts um, programs. So we're very, very happy with this bid. We're actually working with the Department of Procurement to actually put this bid out again, to actually even get more um, 
partners to join this program. So if you know of any that meet any of those categories or even something in between, um, that will be coming out very shortly. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions or comments from colleagues? But motion to approve by Bakhtiari, second by Lewis. Please open the vote. The vote is open and the vote is closed. The item is favorable, 70 yeas, zero nays. Uh, next item. Item number eight is 23R 3425, a resolution by Council Member Matt Westmoreland authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute the First Amendment to agreement number listed here, Summer Food Services Program with Meals Pro Inc. on behalf of the Department of Parks and Recreation to modify Exhibit A, General Scope of Services, to modify Exhibit A, one compensation bid schedule and to fund ad funding in an amount not to exceed seven hundred and ninety thousand six hundred and eighty dollars and zero cents to be charged to and paid from the funding accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Deputy Commissioner Voss. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Again, um, this, uh, the department actually has a summer foods contract and an after-school contract, or traditionally does. Um, what this amendment does is allows the department to utilize the summer foods contract through an amendment to offer after school meals. This will be going out on a bid. We are currently using an emergency contract to offer after school meals, which is not something we wanna do on the long term. So while that process is going forward, we're utilizing a summer foods contract to offer after school me meals until that bid is completed. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So motion to approve by Lewis, second by Westmoreland. Please open the vote. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. The item is favorable, seven yeas, zero nays. Next item. Item number nine is 23R3517, a resolution by Community Development Human Services Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the city of Atlanta to accept an improved land donation from Empire Communities, approximately 1.086 aggregate acres of real property at 80 and 84 Flat Shoals Avenue Southeast to the Department of Parks and Recreation uh, of improvements valued at approximately $115,500.00, which includes site work, landscape, and hardscape improvements to expand Lane Carson Park and for other purposes. And uh, colleagues, there was a recommendation to hold this item. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Vault, I don't know if you had anything to add to that before we take Happy to, or else I'm sure I'll get a question from Councilmember Bakhtiari. Um, the only issue here is we're waiting for the final appraisal. Uh, even though this is a donation and it's a wonderful property, Councilmember and I were all out there just not too long ago, um, we need a full appraisal for title insurance, um, and that is all we're waiting for. Um, and I think we'll be back in less than 30 days. Councilmember Bakhtiari, any questions? Completely understand. Thank you. Um, and as long as we're getting it done and we make that clear to the neighborhood, we're good. Motion to hold. Okay. <laughs> Second. Motion to hold by Bakhtiari. Second by Winston. Please open the vote. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. Motion to hold is favorable. Seven yeas, zero nays. That takes us to the next item, number 10. Item 10, 23R3518, a resolution by Community Development Human Services Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the Department of City Planning to enter into amendment number one for the contractual agreement listed here, supplemental staffing services with Nova Collaborative JV, a joint venture between Nova Engineering and Environmental LLC and the Collaborative Inc. to expand the scope of services to include urban planner positions and for other purposes. Right, we have with us uh, Kieta Holmes, Director of the Office of Zoning and Development. So good to see you again today. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon, Council Members. The item before you today is an amendment to a, a supplemental services contract that's currently in place. The current contract in place provides inspectors to the Office of Buildings. The amendment proposes to allow uh, the contract to provide urban planners and plan reviewers for the Office of Zoning and Development. There will be no increase in the amount of the contract, um, but it will provide services to, a different, for, to an additional office in D.C. Questions or comments from colleagues? Councilmember Bakhtiari. Uh, no, I think Councilmember Westmoreland just moved to approve. I second and also happy belated birthday. Thank you. All right, motion by Westmoreland, second by Bakhtiari. Please open the vote. The vote is open. Vote is closed. All right, the item is favorable, seven yeas, zero nays. That concludes ordinances for, or I'm sorry, that concludes resolutions.
Uh, colleagues, the one item that we had that was dual referred, we've already taken. That takes us to items that are currently held. Uh, we need to take item number 29, uh, which is a CDP amendment. It moved for zoning yesterday. Um, so that's uh, ordinance 23 0 1115. Um, Mr. Evans, if you can sound the caption, and then Ms. Lavendier, if you're still here, I saw you. Okay. Read, read, read very slowly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Duly noted. Go, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. It's 2301115, CDP 2303, an ordinance by Community Development Human Services Committee to amend the land use settlement of the 2021 Atlanta Comprehensive Development Plan so as to redesignate property located at 646. 648 and 652 Echo Street Northwest from the low density residential land use designation to the medium density residential land use designation and for other purposes. This colleagues, item was heard at the CDP hearing on March 8th. All right, thank you. And colleagues, I will just add another was concurrence with the, um, the MPU and with staff and uh, recognizing that this is in District 3, I'll give my colleague, Councilmember Amos, an opportunity to weigh in or provide the final motion of the day. Motion to approve, motion to approve by Amos, all uh, seconded by Bakhtiari. Uh, please open the vote. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. And the item is favorable, 78, is your nays. Uh, colleagues, this concludes our legislation for today, I believe. With that, any general remarks before no. we adjourn? No. No. All right. <laughs> uh, we are adjourned.